Gentlemen, good morning and, and welcome. Welcome to um, Just Transition, the roles and relationships of further and higher education in achieving new zero, uh, uh, net zero and climate justice. My name is Mike Cantley. I'm chair of the Scottish Funding Council. Um, I'm also chair of Nature Scott. So the Funding Council uh, invests in our universities and colleges in Scotland on behalf of government and Nature Scott, previously Scottish Natural uh, Heritage, uh, looks after nature and all aspects of nature from uh, looking after our national nature reserves to all the aspects regarding nature-based solutions and the climate emergency. So uh, it's a privilege for me to be here today. Just Transition is very much on our minds, obviously, in the midst of, of COP, and I look forward to uh, hosting the morning and some of the, the questions that you may have as, as, as an audience as we work our way through, uh, uh, through the day. But first up, it's a great privilege to introduce Ken Spowers. Ken is our keynote speaker this morning. Ken is the uh, Professor Emeritus of the, at the UCL uh, Institute of Education and also a visiting professor at Capital Normal University in Beijing. And as I see, he is our keynote speaker this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Work, welcome, Ken Spowers. So, words, yes, before um, I uh, introduce the presentation. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that my institute, the UCL Institute of Education, has teamed up with City of Glasgow College to organize this very important timely symposium. And I've brought together a wide range of people who are not just interested in the impact of climate change, but specifically in the educational responses to climate change and the challenges of advancing climate justice. Climate change affects all of us, but the impact, but it impacts particularly more on children, young people, and future generations of the world's population. People like us have enjoyed the benefits of industrialization, urbanization, and globalization that exploited the Earth's natural resources. What are we going to leave for our children and future generations? Climate justice is an important and integral part of social justice that we working in education should be and are concerned about. I know that the Secretary of State for Education suggested that young people should be educated about climate change. They and all of us and politicians and policymakers should be educated about climate justice as well. This is why events like this symposium are very important and very useful. We're here to discuss the roles and relationships of further and higher education in achieving net zero and climate justice. Further and higher education institutions like City of Glasgow College and the UCL Institute of Education can play an instrumental role and we must work together in supporting just transition. I'm very grateful for the uh, Scottish Funding Council support and to my colleagues, Ken and Charlie in particular, who will be speaking later. I hope you have a very productive day and I'm looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Wei. Um, I am now going to share my screen. Um, could can anybody see this? No, not thus far. Um, hmm. I'm sorry about this. Um, could could the technicians uh, share the screen from the other end? My presentation. Can, can you see this now? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's coming through, Ken. 
Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Right. Sorry about that. Um, this this presentation is, as the title suggests, about an urgent approach to the just transition. We've seen at the COP conference thus far that there is a codification of uh, the sense of emergency, but not sufficient action. And my central argument today is, is that we must develop a model of change that operates at all levels of society in order that these synergies bring about the necessary acceleration. So this is the, this is the key argument. Um, in this, in this multi-level model that I'm going to construct, uh, I make an argument that there is a, a, a unique role for what I call middle range institutions. And this includes, of course, further and higher education. It includes um, networks, both national, international and local, and also local governance. The, the, the enormous political, economic and societal space that exists between the micro level of everyday life and that of the uh, political state. So it's in this middle range. My argument basically, you have to have an incredibly active middle range in order to accelerate the transition. And that in order to become a key actors, then further and higher education organizations have to reimagine themselves as civic anchor institutions. And I know Glasgow College is one and it'll be interesting for UCL to take up that challenge as well. Can I just say something about the crisis? Um, it's not just one crisis, there are several um, in which the climate emergency intersects with uh, the COVID and post-COVID situation. And, and both of these crises have accentuated and laid bare existing uh, social and economic and geopolitical divisions. Therefore, the argument, as, as I say, is that if we must address the comb combinational crisis and therefore the concept of the just transitions Professor Wei has defined as in fact the race for net zero accompanied by the necessary social justice so those who are most affected by uh, the climate emergency um, are, are, are not only compensated but fully involved in the process. So combinational problems need combinational solutions and that precisely is what the just transition is all about. Um, just to do a, a conceptual deck clearing in the first instance, um, the just I, I've argued here that the just and in the paper that's available, that the just transition should be seen as an umbrella and organizing concept. That is to say, because it, it talks about it, 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 at the societal level as well as the micro level, and it talks about climate uh, strategies and social justice. My argument is that it can contain within it the following terms or the following strategies, Green New Deal, which itself has evolved, green transition, green industrial revolution. So the point I'm making here is, is that by using the just transition as the major grand organizing concept, you can locate within that these other very, very important concepts and strategies. Interestingly and inevitably, the just transition will have differing interpretations. And I've just highlighted two here. First, the most radical one that comes from the Climate Justice Alliance, in which the just transition, as, as the diagram suggests, is about the transitioning of society from an exploitative, extractive one to regenerative, caring and collaborative one. Now, this, uh, this is certainly, I think this is the definition that should be the dominant one, the dominant definition of the just transition. And it also includes within it the concept of reparations. Now, this has been raised this week at COP26 because the, 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 climate, the climate emergency is already impacting on uh, people in the Pacific region in, 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 in the global south. And therefore, it is important that uh, advanced economies and societies pay reparations, not as punishment, but in fact to help these societies to adapt to the very processes and de degradations that are taking place at the, at, at presently. But I also want to add another reparation, and this is a reparation of generations. What a intergen intergenerational justice comes in here, because people like me, my age, have overseen the acceleration of the climate emergency. It's been on our watch. 
and therefore we must be prepared to pay money in order that young people can have reasonable lives and can participate in the just transition. And the point I also make in the papers that it will be easier for people in their micro everyday lives to make these changes if in fact, if governments also support them in the process of doing it. I don't think it's down to the market alone, and I certainly don't just think it's down to the raising of consciousness. There has to be some incentives, and the money's got to come from people like me, and probably people like you. At the other end of the just transition is what I've called a just transition pragmatism. I'm not against it, I'm very much in favor of it. I mean, um, Mariana Mazzucato, who you can see as a theorist of progressive capital, would in fact, I think, point also to the need for private business to be crowding in here. If in fact, the governments can lead and can create what you call the sense of inevitability of policy, then other social actors will join in. And that's gonna be incredibly important because here we will see the just transition as um, of an alliance-based concept. So my point here is we need the radical dominant discourse and we need also, also the pragmatic responses from other social partners to become part of this global movement. So how should we reflect on the just transition as a concept? Well, I've argued that it is combinational and organizing. I think it is also potentially alliance-based because it's different it's capable of different framings and convergences. I think it's going to be incredibly important that the private sector be part of all of this, but it has to be led, I think, by a strong public realm. And we also have to understand different elements of climate justice, in particular, the concepts of restoration and, and, and reparation. But I also think we've got to, there has to be some sense of urgency because there isn't in COP so far. In fact, civil society organisations have been broadly barred from uh, having discussions with the delegates. I think it's going to be really important that we accelerate. And I just before I go on to have a look at the model itself, I want to say something about acceleration. Um, accelerationism's got itself a bad press, basically, because we, uh, the, the literatures are focused on two types. Techno-capitalist acceleration which it maintains that capitalist speed can transform society, and left accelerationism, which is about moving beyond the boundaries of capitalism to liberate the functions of, of, of technologies, particularly machine learning and other artificial intelligence. I want to explore in particular version three. I'm, I'm sympathetic to version two and I reject version one, but I, I want to elaborate version three, which is synergies of ideas and actions of different layers of society and wider global community uh, in bringing about the just transition role. So in, bu I in building this um, multi-level model, I want to look at briefly three elements. Um, a spatial uh, adaptation of uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner's work. Many of you will be familiar with it because it's used in social care, health, education. Um, what Professor Hodgson, Anne Hodgson and I did in the past was we developed the spatial view of this so that the micro refer to everyday relations, the meso institutional organization relations, the exo to local and sub-regional networks and local government, although I think that can be extended, those networks can be extended horizontally, internationally, and to macro level and international policy structures. What I really want to focus on are these middling two levels. They're, I mean, we need national leadership without, and international leadership without a shadow of a doubt, but it's these two middling levels and the role of institutions that I, I really want to focus on today, not to the exclusion of others, by the way. So we have those four levels, but the dynamism doesn't just come by them interacting sir, in, 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 some, uh, in, in some random way. That actually, the, 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 they have dynamism by virtue of connective forces. And it, undoubtedly, what the first and, and most enduring will be the vision, culture, and learning around the climate emergency and the just transition. And this is why edu education institutions are incredibly important, but they're not the only ones involved in the educative process. We have to have a paradigm shift in thinking about the way we live, the future of the planet. It, 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 the emergency demands nothing less. Being a Gramscian, um, I would obviously point to the role of what I term here just transition intellectuals. 
These are not people of letters, by the way, although they can include them, but really they're, they're really political, social, cultural organizers and activists. And so we, uh, we should be producing these. And what's interesting is the younger generation are producing them themselves. That's what's absolutely striking about this, that the just transition intellectuals are coming from a different age group than people like myself and, and, and good that's happening too. They are the connectors. I think um, the Climate U project, which has given some very valuable input uh, to uh, this uh, presentation and to the paper, I want to stress the, the role of networks, not simply being local and sub-regional, uh, but also being global. Um, and to highlight the role of those in the climate front line. And I'm very glad to see that they will be playing a major role in the rest of the deliberations today. I also want to talk about technologies. Now here, I'm not talking about a technological fix. I don't think technology by itself gets us out of the hole that we have dug for ourselves and our relationship with the planet. But I do believe that socialized advanced technologies, machine learning and artificial intelligence have a vital role to play. The, these aspects of the fourth industrial revolution have got to be bent to the purposes of the just transition, working in conjunction with the other connective social political forces that, are, that bring the synergy to this just transition social ecosystem. And I want to talk about time. We have a paradox in terms of time. On the one hand, the just transition is a long haul, but it's also a sprint because we, in, in a sense, we've got to get going and we want to see an acceleration of these processes of change in order to be ahead of the crisis and not constantly behind it. The third part of the model comes from my wider politics on the democratic left. And what I want to point to here in this diagram, complex diagram, is that you can't just get change through networks. I'm not a network idealist. I really believe in networks, but networks have to reciprocate with other levels. And therefore, what this, what 45 degree politics are, is about, is about this relationship between what I call collaborative and radical horizontalities and the facilitating vertical. We need experts, but we need progressive experts. But we need those experts being informed by a progressive general intellect from below. So what this, mod what this model is suggesting in conjunction with a multi-level one is there has to be a, di a strong dialectic between these, uh, the horizontal forces that drive this change and the facilitating vertical. We need good government, the good state, and we need good vertical progressive knowledge and scientists to help with this. I mean, we remember Thunberg says, listen to the scientists, but listen to the scientists who really understand and care about this. And this dialectic is the one that really starts to drive the acceleration. So to summarize this model, the model is multi-level, but it emphasizes building from the middle, the connection. And this is, this is why further and higher education institutions and their networks and local governance are so important. I want to, I think today at the end of this discussion, I want to talk about building and creating just transition organizations. I, I, think they, I think that they are the next step for a civic anchor institution. I think it's really important that we build radical collaborative horizontalities. And here we're not just simply talking about local networks, but the global ones that we're going to hear about uh, later this morning, that they all become an offense, a network of networks. I think it's incredibly important that we develop the, the just transition intellectuals, that they come from all parts of society, but they participate in an educative connective mission to connect the different layers and synergies of activity. And as I say, uh, we need to, as it were, link the, link the vertical uh, to the horizontal. I just want to finish uh, very uh, swiftly on, on, on some of the roles for further higher education, because I know that uh, Dr. Little will, will want to comment on this in particular. I, I think there are some key principles here. It must be inclusion focused, um, focusing on uh, supporting the, further, the agency of the most vulnerable and greater democratization and goal setting and decision making. I just wish 
some of the COP26 delegates uh, and the organizers really understood this. I think it has to be connective with key roles for educative organizations in the middle range, but they're not the only actors, but they're ones that can take very, very important first steps. I think it has to be collaborative and democratic with alliance building and with particular rules for citizens' assemblies. What's interesting is citizens' assemblies have, where they've taken place in Wales and elsewhere, have for very, very constructive and forward-looking uh, solutions to strategies. And we've got to be highly innovative. I mean, we have to be developing new knowledge, new technologies, new strategies, thinking in absolutely new paradigm, uh, uh, paradigm ways. What this means for further and higher education, for, for colleges, for universities and hybrid institutions, is a massive expansion of their roles. Now, I'm not going to go through this list. I don't have time. But I, I think it has a curriculum dimension. I think it has organizational and networking dimensions, has labor market dimensions. It has technological dimensions um, and it has political dimensions. And so uh, and, you know, this is just a provisional list. And, and, and the final slide is really saying, well, how do we get going? And again, I don't want to go through the list, but I think it's really, really important that institutions that want to embark on this journey reanalyze and extend and expand their missions. Already some of them are becoming civic anchor institutions. The Just Transition organization demands additional commitments, more, even more outward looking and organic commitments uh, by organizations to support both uh, the climate strategies and, and the socially just strategies. So I, 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 leave with, uh, I leave us with five questions. I mean, the first one is how do we respond to COP26 thus far? Um, there may be other ways of conceptualizing the just transition. I'd be very interested in hearing about them. In particular, I, I, I think that middle range organizations operating in the meso exo layers of the just transition ecosystem have incredibly important roles to play. And they, I'd like to see that, that elaborated uh, this morning. And I mean, and how do we? actually make uh, our own local and sub-regional and national approaches connective with the wider global communities that are absolutely in the front line of this struggle to achieve a more sustainable relationship between humanity and the planet. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you, Ken. Um, I will open to some questions in a minute or two, but first up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Little. He is, of course, principal of City of uh, Glasgow College, and I think you'd like to make a few comments to start. Are you coming up here? Good morning, everyone. Um, can I like to add my welcome? Uh, online and to here to, to Glasgow and indeed to this very important seminar. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Spurs for what I think is both a powerful and a timely uh, provocation paper which we hope to, if you like, add to during our discussions today. And I'd like to harness the wisdom of the room, so please try and engage if you might. Clearly, um, all these changes are context specific and clearly this is a problem that's not going to solve itself. It's interesting, as I was walking to college today, I was passed by an unusual coloured bus, brightly coloured because of COP, and it had on the side, clean energy for a green future. Now you might think, well, well that's great, that's on message. For me, actually, that just reminded me of the complacency that we all have. We don't want a green future, we want a green present. And I think the challenge here as we go to that green uh, uh, present is to harness what we've done already and to pick up the pace. So in many ways, um, some of my reflections are about that we need leadership, we need courage, we need concerted action, and we need collaboration. And I think today is a great example of that in practice. I am uh, wondering, as all these leaders uh, convene, whether it will be a good COP or a bad COP. How will you know? Well, you will only know if there is a how and a when. I think we have got some 40,000 uh, Gretas at the City of Glasgow College, and they are fed up 
with the blah, blah, blah of ambition. They really want to know when this is going to happen. And, you know, that's very important for all of us because, you know, ultimately, um, I think what has to happen in this just transition, Ken, is that we have to act now, not tomorrow. And in many ways, uh, what I would uh, encourage you all to do is think of uh, another young man in a hurry, President uh, John F. Kennedy, who once said, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. So there's no point in leaving it to the political leaders or the UN delegates. You know, what are you doing today? Not tomorrow, not for that future. What is, what's your green present today after this particular seminar? And I spent some time in my uh, presidential chamber role with uh, some global CEOs during COP, and I was particularly heartened by the engagement of the business community. Now, what's different between COP21, if you like, the Paris Accord, and COP26, the Glasgow Accord, is actually the engagement of the business community. They are here. They weren't here in any numbers in COP21. But more importantly that, they are engaged uh, and they're motivated. At an event uh, that City of Glasgow uh, convened for COP26, one of 100, um, we have major shipping ministers and major delegates from you know, a key part of that sector, the maritime sector. And I was struck by two uh, interventions uh, on Saturday. One was an American CEO, of a very large uh, fleet, who said, all you need is the money. And then another delegate, interestingly, from the UK and in particular from Liverpool, said, well, actually, I disagree. All you need is love. Obviously, that Beatles thing. And that wasn't just some trite remark. What that meant is that ultimately the money is there. It's how it's used. But what is not there is the kindness and that human dimension which we're missing. So sometimes we treat lots of what we're doing, I hope we don't do that today in this academic seminar, in the abstract, when we have to bring it down to the personal. What am I going to do, not necessarily what are we going to do, or more importantly, not what they are going to do. So this isn't all about those global leaders and those UN delegates. Actually, it has to be centered on me and us and what I as an individual will do. I think that's, that's very, very important because I agree, Ken, uh, in pursuing this collective that you mentioned in the paper between the university and the college, that is actually how we should proceed. And we should proceed not in a hierarchy, but in a system-led approach. And I'm very proud of the, the way Scotland has actually engaged in that over the last decade. Um, it's very fitting indeed that for 400 years, Scotland crisscrossed the world in mercantile trade, and here we are uh, in Glasgow 400 years later with the world coming to Glasgow. But Scotland and the Scottish government have been actually very visionary in how they're approaching this. And in the institution that we find ourselves in, the decision to create that had to be a cabinet level decision to create a super college for Scotland, to move away from a marketized system that happens elsewhere in the UK to a managed system. And I think that managed system is what's going to allow us to create cross-silo leadership and enable collaboration in a greater way and indeed allow the more inputs, not the less inputs, not the few inputs, but the many inputs, which are absolutely going to need it. And actually, the institution you find yourself on is now localised in 13 regions across Scotland. There's a much more comprehensive, they've got a, a closer linkage to the Scottish Fund of Council, to the Scottish Government, to Skills Development Scotland. There's a greater coherence. So it's not just about convening, it's coherence in addition to that. And, you know, when some of my colleagues from UCL came in today, they were quite uh, blown away by the scale and the size of City of Glasgow College. It is a super college. It's it's a college on an industrial scale. Because ladies and gentlemen, the problem that we face, this green transition, this just transition, has to be tackled at scale and at pace. And one of the delegates that we convened as a, as a college was Greta Fermo. She is uh, Under Secretary of the United Nations Operations Branch. And she came here and she spoke to our students didn't spare any blushes. She was a former defence minister from Norway, and they asked her about defence issues, and they asked her about all sorts of issues that the UN are, are engaged in about the climate uh, action. 
But one of the things that she brought home to me was the importance of infrastructure. UNOPS is very much involved in enabling the UN infrastructure around the world. And I think as part of our uh, discussion here today, let's remember that the, our funders and our governments provide the money for that infrastructure, but how do we use that infrastructure? For example, do we lock in problems to that infrastructure? And that's what they were very concerned about in the United Nations, that they didn't want to bring in further injustice in that infrastructure. And I'd like to think that the funding council and the government are demonstrating that they're not doing that. This money could have gone to universities. This money could have gone to our research institutes, but it went to technological education and it went to professional education. So we're not trying to lock in for the next 50 years further injustice or further, if you like, positioning in a hierarchy. We're trying to demonstrate here in Scotland that we are, we are trying to do something different. And in fact, we, we sometimes refer to the city of Glasgow College as a next generation college. We want others from around the world to come and see here in Scotland as a powerhouse of some 2,000 courses, as a powerhouse of some 8,000 graduates every year, how that can help Scotland and Glasgow and indeed our metropolitan economy respond to the challenges. Because let's be clear, uh, colleagues, um, in our present bifurcated further and higher education, we are actually locking in that injustice if we continue with those terms. And that's why I was very pleased that the Scottish Government and the Funding Council uh, took the recommendations from the Cumber for Little report and changed the language to tertiary. So language is very important. Not just what I can do, but what I say. It's not how you do it, it's how you say it very often. And as our delegates are convening and discussing uh, the further challenges in the climate, they are using words that are inclusive and they're using words that are action oriented But we also have responsibility to do. So the challenge is, how do we, in this just transition, how do we leave nobody behind? And what do you mean by that? Well, actually, how often have you been in a discussion where we're talking about the importance of girls and women? How often have you been in a discussion where we're talking about the importance of ethnic communities? How often are you in a discussion where you're talking about minorities? We, we should surface these issues and actually put them front and center in our language and put them into the debate. And it's important that you know, we understand that there is a debate here. There's a debate between talent and a meritocracy, and there's a debate between family and class. We don't talk about class. We're very happy to talk about gender. We're very happy to talk about inclusiveness, but we don't actually say one of the hidden problems in this just transition is actually tackling some of the class divisions that Ken talked about. And let's be clear, in academia, we're also part of the problem, but we need to be part of the solution. In the UK, we suffer in our uh, academic structure in our education structure of a concept in, in the UK called educationalism. In America, that will be called credentialism. In other words, unless you've got the right qualification after your name, you don't matter. And in the good old days, we had multiple ladders of advantage. Because as Ken's pointed out, we don't just have one crisis. Ken, I actually reckon we've got eight crises. We've got this health emergency, we've got deepening inequality, we've got stagnant social mobility, we've got diminished aspirations, we've got fractured social justice, we've got an economic emergency, we've got a retreat to the trade unions, we've got bad work, not good work, in fact, we've got debt mountains. Those are emergencies of all enormous proportions. And when are we talking about Brexit? Brexit either compounds all the solutions or it enables all those solutions. I think it compounds all those solutions. So the challenge is, when are we going to move away from elitism in academia and in the tertiary world? When are we going to move to the challenges that we in this room, we on this debate have to talk about? What about our own hypocrisy? What about what we're trying to do in terms of bringing the many to the table, not the few? And I hope our paper genuinely uh, helps to bring that forward. I hope that actually we, we bring meaning and purpose to this particular bit. One of the language words I'd like to see more use is the word skills, because skills are indeed part of that solution for the future. 
You know, when you think about it, we need to find some very smart solutions. And I think those smart solutions are, as Ken pointed out, those mid-size institutions and the role that, you know, UCL, City of Glasgow College makes. Why? Well, they're pioneers. They are global leaders, both within their respective fields. So they have a very important role in actually presenting to the wider world some of those smart solutions. Technological skills are part of those smart solutions. Micro-credentials are part of those smart solutions. And I would argue that it's that kind of combination of momentum, of innovation, of workforce innovation, of academic and vocational innovation, of tertiary innovation, if you will, that we will be able to bring that meaning, that purpose, and indeed that transformation, because this problem won't solve itself. This problem isn't for them. This problem is for us too, as we try and work our way through, because that challenge here is the game of life, the game of dominance game, the virtue game, the game of success that we all play in our different roles um, because we can't afford to leave anybody in hind in this just transition. So if we are trying to do that, we need to get to the how as well. The when, we're happening, it's here, it's present. Uh, City of Glasgow College, UCL are using their combined convening power to bring great minds to the debate today, both on the digital sphere and indeed present. So I'm looking forward to hearing those discussions. I'm looking forward to taking this momentum. But actually, we have started. Let's not forget that. We have started this debate before now. And I want to take you back to that UN uh, very inspirational input that we had this week. And Greta not Greta Thunberg, but Greta Fermo said, if you really want to bring transformational change, you've got to kill your darlings. So what darlings in academia are we prepared to kill to really bring that change? I look forward to hearing the contributions. Thank you very much. And Ken, I, I take it we still have you virtually? Somewhere? Yes, you do. Yes, there we go. Yep, there we go. Nice to see you, Ken. Just a comment from me um, uh, on, uh, on uh, wearing my other hat, I think, the uh, Nature Scott hat. I suppose just to put this moment in time into, in, into position for, for, for Scotland, I suppose, for every country. So if you take the nature the situation with nature, basically nature-based solutions will be something like 30% of most countries' um, uh, weaponry in terms of their approach to dealing with the, uh, uh, the climate emergency. That's a whole range of different things from, from trees, everybody mentioned trees, but it's agri-environment, it's marine environment, uh, blue carbon, etc. Um, we have a specific in Scotland in the form of peatland restoration because uh, our peat, degraded peat, is roughly 20% of our, of our um, emissions target that we're trying to, trying to tackle. And if you just get your mind around some of the figures for a minute, as, as government does on just one single topic, um, we have a target this year of about 25,000 hectares of, of peat to improve, and very rapidly that will negate the, the, the loss. Um, now, it took 10 years to do 25,000 hectares uh, of peatland restoration, so we're now going to try and tackle 25,000 hectares in one year. So that's a huge, a huge obstacle um, to, to overcome and a, and a huge challenge. There's 1.8 million hectares to do. And you can do the maths, 1.8 million hectares. The scale is incredible. And it's quite simple work, um, but it takes vast amounts of uh, money, clearly, uh, equipment, and vast amounts of people. So on, on the question of, um, uh, uh, of, of money and, and love, we need, we need money. We certainly need love, but we need vast amounts of people. And, and surely, however you look at the challenges that government have, the projects are either related to imponderables, like how do you, you know, fix the boiler issue? Uh, how do you how do you move transport to uh, um, uh, away from uh, fossil fuels? 
Um, but also imponderables in terms of the profound scale, uh, scale beyond anything that we can actually tackle. The only thing stopping us doing, uh, completing the job in peatland restoration is the scale in terms of finding the money to do it and actually physically doing it. And my point, I suppose, is this, and maybe uh, I'll ask the first question for, for, for Ken, and uh, then I'd invite some, so, so, some others. In terms of the model you presented to us th this morning, Ken, with some of the profound choices that governments have in terms of prioritization, um, are you ahead of your time in terms of um, the model being uh, appropriate for today? Um, or is, is the model that you presented to us, the paper you presented to us today, a paper for today and now when the governments of the world have such profound choices to make in terms of prioritization? Over to you, Ken. Um, I think the, the model, I think the model is, is intended to scope out the necessary levels of action that have to take place now. And that the action has to be a reciprocal one on different terrains. I also, so that, yes, it is about the present, it, 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 not just the future. But also, in order to kickstart this, I'm arguing that middle range institutions have got to reach out to the activists and the other forces in order to accelerate. So it, if you think about the challenge that you have just put about instituting land, land restoration, re regeneration, then you're going to, you know, where would, would people have to be qualified to do that? Would they just be volunteers? Um, what, what role would colleges and universities have in providing any further expertise in terms of this so that, that everybody understands that, that those millions of hectares have to be transformed? But in order to transform the hectares, you could take that situation and apply a multi-level model to it. That's the point. From people at the bottom, you know, at the very root of micro relations and the ones of kindness and love, right through to national government providing uh, and international bodies providing the resources. But then you have to have the intermediate organization in order to bring it about at scale and at pace. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Paul a question uh, just before I ask. I'm maybe going to uh, look for a couple of um, questions or just uh, if you'd like to, uh, rather than ask a question, just uh, add a reflection to what you've seen so far in a moment. But the question for you, Paul, I mean, uh, the point that, that Ken made uh, was uh, along the way was about the scale of technological transformation. We could see that coming. Uh, for, for a few years, and it's unusual when you see the kind of technological advances that we're seeing in terms of automation, et cetera, that you can, you can see what's coming in, in, in 10 years' time. Uh, I drove my Tesla to, to Glasgow today. Uh, it didn't drive itself, but it will be driving itself in the years to come and so on. Um, and you add that to, to net zero in the debate we're having today, and then you add COVID, and then you add Brexit, and you have this extraordinary moment in time where from the perspective of further and higher education in a college like this, a year ago, we were preparing for mass unemployment. Today, the labor market is at the absolute other end of the scale where um, we have uh, a profound, um, at most, mo almost every business in the UK is desperately looking for, for people. And um, as we look forward, in terms of the challenges we were just expressing there, um, to, to answer the call of, uh, of uh, net zero. Um, the change again, um, and the call to uh, universities and colleges will be profound. So how, how can an institution like a college provide the flexibility that is required in the midst of all those challenges that have landed on our doorstep at one time? Paul. Um, great question, Mike. Uh, you know, I, I reflect that, you know, we have a, a post-industrial economy with pre-industrial politics. And the challenge of that is institutions like this have to navigate between the two. 
they have to respond to the, the changing needs of that economy whilst engaging and influence politicians who are stuck in a different era at a different time. So given that we are an agile institution, given that realistically we, we formed the super campus five years ago and we, we, we came with this concept some 10 years ago, we do so with, um, as an anchor institution that can, and, and Paul Granger actually, uh, you know, and I, you know, surfaced about four years ago, we do so as a civic anchor, as an economic anchor, as a symbiotic partner to business. So in the past, uh, institutions like our predecessors were transactional in their relationship with business. Now, 21st century institutions like this are, are symbiotic. We are hardwired into the SME community. Um, we engage, I, I earlier on spoke as the president of the Chamber of Commerce and as a principal of the college. We, we are trusted by the business community and the industrial community and indeed the, 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 the wider civic Glasgow community. So we, we earn that trust, we, we don't betray that trust and we try to provide solutions to the needs of business, to the needs of industry and to needs of the wider civic society here in Scotland. And we do so because we're inclusive. We do so because we try to design our campuses that everybody matters in it, that it works on a human scale. And we do so because we try to provide pathways for uh, an unconfident learner returning into tertiary education that can actually stay in this institution and actually study to degree level and does not do not have to move off to a, another institution where they don't know the relationships with the, the tutors and they don't know their peer groups in another institution. And we do so because we are at the very heart of Glasgow. We are geographically at the very heart of Glasgow, both at the city campus in the oldest street of Glasgow, Cathedral Street, and indeed by the river uh, on, on, um, on Thistle Street. So the challenge is we, we, we build on the excellent work that our predecessor institutions had and they were launched themselves in the white heat of technology by Howard Wilson, but we do so for the 21st century. We do so with the skills and in particular, the technological skills that are needed for this 21st century. And I mentioned again, uh, micro credentials, 20 hours of learning, not four years of learning. Okay, thank you. Listen, uh, you've been patient. Um, any questions or comments from the audience? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I'm Paul Granger from UCL. Hello, Paul. Um, some years ago, I was chatting to Ken Livingstone um, who would just been voted out of office as mayor of London, and the agenda was climate change. Uh, it was a small meeting, um, and he was saying, "You know, democracies are going to have trouble um, with climate change. Um, it may be that the autocratic regimes are going to do better because they can say stop burning coal, recycle plastic, and just um, impose a solution." Well, of course, in the intervening years, he's been proven wrong. Uh, and it is quite clear that climate change is not going to come about without there being democratic buy-in on all parts. It makes you sort of ponder what an unjust transition would be like, uh, because autocrats have this need to provide bread and circuses. And, and it does seem that the history of the last 10 years has been that democracies have made much more progress through this notion of a just transition. I'd just like to highlight a danger, which is that people use the notion of climate change and the just transition to impose other liberal aspirations. My, one of my daughters is outside somewhere in, in the city with a placard and a woolly hat. And, and she has a very complex agenda. Um, and I, it, it would be very easy to get into diversive debates as to what elements of a liberal future might be put into the just transition when the crisis is actually to do with the climate 
uh, and, and global warming. So I think it's important in our discussions that we are very, um, are very tight in, what, in, in our definition of, of, of what we want and we don't go down and get sidetracked by what Paul's just called darlings and other agendas which are admirable and aspirational but won't actually save the planet. Okay, so let me ask you um, a, a question, Paul, which is quite simply, do we have the definition of just transition uh, to allow us to have the conversations that uh, you know, we're having today in terms of the appropriate models for further and higher education to go forward? Do we have that clarity of what ju just transition means? No, but I think it's emerging, um, and I'm absolutely delighted that this conference is run jointly by a university uh, and a college, because by and large, and Paul may violently disagree with me here, but by and large, um, universities have, have ideas, some of which are short-lived. Um, colleges are much more hard-nosed. They're integrated very tightly into the notion of work, employment, and the economy. And they know what works. Um, I think we need more debate as to exactly what just transition means, and it will mean something different in Scotland to, let's say, Australia or, or to parts of the developing world. I, I think all communities need to have this discussion of what their just transition is. But at its core must be the notion of focusing on climate change. Yeah, good. Right, listen, I'll tell you what we're going to do now because we have a plenary session coming uh, just uh, just shortly. I'd like to, to go back to U UCL and Charlie Nussi is going to introduce her team and specifically talk through um, uh, a specific project that UCL has been working on, Charlie. Now, can you introduce your team and then I will uh, leave you to uh, the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Charlie Nussi. I'm a research fellow at University College London. Um, and with me um, this morning are a number of um, colleagues from UCL. So from right to left, we have Ketan Dandere, um, who is a doctoral colleague who's been working with us on our systematic review, um, which we're going to talk to you about this morning. Um, we have Lorena Sanchez Tyson, um, who's also um, recently completed her doctorate. So Dr. Lorena Sanchez Tyson. Um, who's also been working on the systematic review. And last but not least, we have Joy Perry, um, who's been working on the same work with us. And then to my left, we have Kate Fox, who is an MA student who's been working with us on our survey, um, all of which we're going to tell you about this morning. Um, so I think I'm going to stand up and, and move to the lectern. <clears throat> I'd just like to start with, with a thank you to the City of, College, uh, City of Glasgow College for organising this event and for welcoming us so wonderfully. Um, it's been such a pleasure to be here and to participate in some of the COP activities as well as the protests on Saturday and to think about what climate justice looks like. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that when we're talking about justice, that there's a huge range of colleagues um, associated with this project who are not in the room and who are not present. Um, so I have colleagues um, working uh, with me on, on the project who are not able to join us today. And I'd like to acknowledge their contributions explicitly, both in terms of this presentation, but also in terms of the broader work of the project. Um, so the project that we're going to be reflecting on is called Transforming Universities for a Changing Climate. And it's thinking about the relationship between higher education and climate change, um, with particular reference to uh, four countries, to Kenya, to Fiji, to Mozambique, um, and to Brazil. And so the partners um, that you can see their logos on the front slide are the University of South Pacific in Fiji, um, Kenyatta University in Kenya, UPF, which is University of Pasifundo in Brazil, in southern Brazil, um, and University of Eduardo Mondlane in Mozambique. Um, so those are our partners. Um, and we're also working with IIED, um, the uh, International Institute of Education and Development and the Association of Commonwealth Universities as our impact partner. 
So as I said, we work in, in the four different countries and thinking about that relationship in terms of justice, um, one of the things that is really important to us is that the relationship is, not collabor is one of collaboration, that it's not one of being led top down as many research partnerships in the past have been by a country from the global north setting the agenda, setting the kind of ways that the project works while countries in the Global South and partners in the Global South deliver that agenda. So what we're trying to do through this three-year GCRF project is to really think differently. And so that justice through the way that the project itself is defined, the project aims, the evolution of those aims, particularly through South-South partnerships, through our four country partners, is absolutely part of that. And that really relates to another aim of our project, which is around epistemic justice, knowledge-based justice. Justice that reflects that lots of the knowledge that we have around climate change doesn't come from the university context. It comes from the communities, the social movements, the actors on the front line of climate injustice. And it's their knowledge and their reflections and their work, their agency, um, that we really want to foster and engage with. So in Ken's kind of idea of the middle space, the way that we're thinking about the middle space as a project is really to engage with those communities and the work already happening on the ground and the knowledge already happening um, and the knowledge that they already bring to bear to the problem. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we aim to do that. So broadly speaking, there are four different dimensions of our work. Some of them are desk-based, focusing on understanding systems of higher education through literature reviews, both at the global level, understanding the global picture, and we'll talk to you a little bit about that. We've done a systematic review of the global literature, understanding universities' responses to climate change. Um, some of those are national and some of those are already um, published and available on our website, looking at the context, for example, of Brazil or of Kenya and um, with Fiji and Mozambique to follow. Um, also in that work package, Understanding Systems of Higher Education, is a survey that we've done um, and which is still ongoing. So we've aimed to survey 12,000 undergraduate students in 12 different participating universities in those four countries. And we'll report with Kate on some of those emerging findings this morning. Then some of the work that we do is theoretical, building a theory of um, university impact. So trying to understand using some of the theories, for example, theories of climate justice, what university impact looks like. And actually thinking about impact differently. So impact for universities is often understood in terms of publications, in terms of the ref, um, and we want to think about how universities can impact in a bi-directional relationship the communities that they work with and at the global level. Possibly the most interesting, and we'll kind of move to um, discussion of this work package, work package three this afternoon, is the idea of universities themselves as actors, of universities as change makers, of universities as working and as not just thinking, as kind of traditionally might be understood as universities. So we'll talk to you a little bit about um, universities as change makers and how we've resolved to try and work through that through the participatory action research that we do. And then the final dimension is the global dimension and thinking about universities engaging both cross connections between different universities. Um, so that MISO level working across the kind of global connections of higher education institutions, but also of thinking of universities as speaking up to these high level discussions, not just of following the science, but of a dialogue between the science, the activists, the politicians, the policy makers, and people at the community level. So um, we kind of want to think about that kind of idea of global knowledge sharing, co-creation, and um, co-participation. So one of the things that I think might add to Ken's presentation is a paper which was written by our principal investigator who unfortunately couldn't join us today, but Professor Tristan McCowan published last year um, a paper trying to understand how universities, what might work within that middle space. And what I particularly wanted to draw your attention to is the kind of traditional understanding of universities as knowledge flowing out of them, of a kind of understanding of impact coming from the university outwards. 
And in our project, what we're really trying to work with is the idea of knowledge coming back into universities, of that idea of dialogue. So in the diagram that you can see on the slide, you can think about feedback loops. So we heard about the um, circular economy in relation to the just transition. We would also think about that in terms of circular knowledges, of the way that knowledge flows between society, perhaps through bridging actors like graduates, organisations and communities, but coming back of understanding and not just thinking about knowledge flowing in one way. So in addition to the kind of understandings of collaborative forms of justice and of epistemic knowledge-based forms of justice, a key dimension to our project is also procedural forms of justice in terms of how we engage with communities. And our um, principles and steps for the participatory action research, which we'll talk to you a little bit about, have got these very um, specific principles around learning, around reflexivity, around cycles, around strategic and grounded um, kind of ways of working, around recognizing indigenous and community-based knowledges, around immersion, not just going quickly and then leaving communities, but actually engaging in multiple dialogues over multiple periods of time, and about that deeply being seated in, in understandings of ethics, of diversity, and of inclusion. So what we would argue is that participatory research itself and universities reaching out through processes of participatory research is one of the mechanisms why, by which climate justice can be fostered. And um, that as a participatory and as a procedural form of justice is really, really important to us. And we would add that to the ideas of the middle space that Ken's introduced. I'm going to ask my colleagues now to um, come and join me up to talk about the um, systematic review of the evidence that we have so far and feed that into some of the ideas for a just transition. So I'll just quickly introduce the systematic review that we've done so far, explain a little bit about the methodology and then invite my colleagues in turn to tell you about specific themes within that systematic review. So what is a systematic review? A systematic review um, is kind of what it says on the tin, really. You go through the research in a very logical way. You try to gain some kind of objective perspective on the different forms of evidence that you have to answer a particular question. So the question that our um, research was asking was, how are university responses to climate change understood? And we ended up with about 190 different journal articles um, from um, a range of countries. But thinking about that idea of epistemic justice and whose knowledge counts, whose knowledge is valued on the global stage, whose perspectives and whose voices are we listening to, I would really like to draw your attention to the dominance of Anglophone and Global North countries, particularly the United States, Canada, Australia and United Kingdom, in producing knowledge around university responses to climate change. So there's a paucity of evidence in the academic literature um, coming from um, Global South contexts, the communities at the front line um, of uh, climate justice. And so what we want to think about in relation to this systematic review is how can we leave a different forms of evidence so perhaps one of the darlings is this idea of evidence-based policy. How can we expand that criteria of what counts as evidence? So broadly speaking, of the different articles which we ended up looking at, we divided them into three different kinds of themes. And these are three different ways in which universities can work in that middle space. Um, so the first biggest theme that came up was around education directly, so particularly through pedagogy and the curriculum. The second is through contributing to technological innovation through knowledge production. And what we were really interested in the systematic review was um, colleagues from universities, wherever they were situated, who reflected on the politics and processes behind that knowledge production. So not the actual content of the research itself, but how the research agenda gets set and by whom. 
Then there is another big body of evidence around campus operations, about thinking about sustainable campuses, um, both in terms of governance, in terms of the kind of people-based um, understandings of campus, but also in terms of the buildings, the infrastructure, and then finally in terms of the investments and the finances and the ways that those related to sustainable campuses and sustainable higher education and tertiary education systems. Then there was a set of evidence around service delivery, which we call outreach and extension, but you can call all sorts of different things, which might include um, secondments, it might include um, relationships with industry, it might include the kinds of relationships with business that the City of Glasgow introduced us to this morning in the business breakfast. And then finally, we had a lot less evidence about the public good contributions of university around the university's role in contributing to public debate and the deliberative space that universities offered. But those, broadly speaking, were the five different themes that we were looking at. So I'm going to now invite Joy to come up and share some thoughts about pedagogy from our research. So as Charlie mentioned, pedagogy was one of our primary themes that we identified as a university response to climate change. And of course, um, the term pedagogy here encompasses both practical and theoretical approaches to teaching and learning about issues related to climate change and sustainability education. And the first area of focus here is how interdisciplinary partnerships in teaching sustainability education can help students gain a more sophisticated understanding of climate change, and also how implementing a distributed leadership methodology might allow op uh, universities to operate more as um, communities of practice, if you will. And what's interesting here is that it is often the informal or implicit practices and values set by the university which are um, quite significant uh, to students' appreciation for these topics. Um, and that um, instilling a sense of collective responsibility is critical for not only how pupils learn, but also in how they take responsibility for these issues themselves in their own lives. Then, of course, um, we've seen that applying concepts to the actual lives of learners and allowing them opportunities to draw meaningful connections with the environment are significant, significant sorry, pedagogical dimensions to teaching about climate change. And this can be accomplished, for instance, um, through devising field experiments or internships with local industries and businesses, and in general, encouraging pupils to become involved with new and existing sustainability projects. Um, the role of the learner as active in their education can really not be understated here. And then, of course, there's some discussion on the use of online learning platforms and new technologies. Perhaps the um, most interesting study that we came across was one that dealt with the development and delivery of what's called a massive open online course, or a MOOC. Um, it is a web-based learning platform for encouraging dialogue, collaboration, and contributing to learning. And finally, it's necessary to identify areas where students are perhaps underprepared and where existing programs um, are lacking, what they are lacking. Within this theme of pedagogy, we identified uh, teacher training as a sort of sub-theme, and this can be split between understanding or sorry, evaluating and optimizing university education programs for aspiring or pre-service teachers, and also professional development of existing teachers, um, for example, through ongoing collaborative teacher training events. And I'll just end by highlighting some of the uh, recurring concepts that we found related to cross-disciplinary and transformative approaches to teacher education. Um, specifically as well, the, the emotional and interpersonal dimensions to pedagogy and the implications of what have been longstanding neoliberal uh, policies and agendas in education. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, so I'm now going to invite Katan to come and talk about some of the findings associated with curriculum. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, 
under this theme, we looked at how universities have responded to climate change uh, by transforming their curriculum, modifying their curriculum, uh, and uh, the way they look at these transformations. So some, some universities look at them as infusing climate change and ideas related to, uh, related to climate change into their curriculum, whereas few universities looked at uh, really uh, completely transforming the curriculum where, uh, by bringing climate change as, as a core issue. Uh, whereas in, in some cases, we found that universities kind of looked at climate change as an afterthought where they do recognize the importance of the issue, uh, but they are still not willing to uh, leave the core kind of or the traditional thinking uh, about curricula. Uh, so one of the major finding was that th there, is a, there is a preponderance of STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So when it came, comes down to changing the curricula, uh, the sort of subjects or disciplines for which the curricula were transformed or for which the curricula uh, were considered, uh, they mostly related to the scientific uh, or the STEM disciplines. So that could be the physics, chemistry, biology, geology, or geography, and, and, and so on and so forth. But what were uh, really uh, lacking was a focus on social sciences or humanities. So for instance, uh, there was hardly any uh, uh, university-wide uh, curriculum uh, transformation drive regarding, let's say, uh, social work or fine arts or classics or English. And so these, these sort of uh, things that uh, were not evident when universities were thinking of climate change and curricula. So that, that raises certain interesting questions uh, and it helps in understanding uh, how climate change is framed by universities in terms of their curricular perspectives and how universities understand where or who uh, or which sort of subjects should look at climate change. So there is a hierarchy here and that was quite evident in the way university responded uh, to climate change in terms of uh, curricula. The other thing that came out of, the, uh, out of the curriculum theme was how universities looked at the global connections. And this could be understood, of course, in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways that that came out was some universities have a very uh, anchored relationship with their local communities. And so what they tried to do was uh, bring in climate change and uh, uh, sort of make that very contextualized to the local uh, region in which, they are, uh, in which they are situated and then try to uh, bring in the communities and also make it contextually interesting for the students. Uh, so in doing so, there was this idea of, okay, there's, this is a global crisis, but it's also affecting at, at a local level. So there was that interplay between global and local understanding. Uh, but again, uh, as I said, that there was, uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is these global connections, the most majority of these uh, the transformations came from uh, the global north. So there was a real paucity of university responding to climate change uh, and those studies emanating from the global south. So these were, uh, so that, that was, an, uh, uh, that was a, uh, an interesting finding. And this also helped in understanding how uh, we are, uh, how the curriculum transformation may shape global lo local connection because by including or the way university curricula are now looking at climate change and now they are, that curriculum is being used by, uh, by the students who would be future leaders, future consumers, uh, future business people and that is going to shape their understanding of what global uh, what the, what the global crisis means and what is uh, how should we respond to it and what would be the what would be the scale of that response and all those things are being shaped by uh, by the by the way curriculum uh, is being transformed by the universities so these these were some of the uh, major findings that we came across uh, when we talked about curriculum and climate change uh, thanks Um, 
Um, one of the other dimensions that we looked at was around the research agenda. Um, and that was particularly concerned with the dynamics of knowledge production. Um, so two of the articles that we wrote, uh, were looking at were written from perspectives of the authors in the global south. So there was <clears throat> something quite unusual around the research agenda theme, that it was dominated by authors from the global south. But perhaps we can start to think about that in terms of um, global south authors critiquing the way that the research agenda is set. So that particularly included reflections around epistemic violence, around the exclusion of particular forms of knowledge, and privileging of hard science and emissions as being a kind of concern of the global north, a kind of concern of climate change mitigation that didn't really necessarily welcome the full breadth of work that's needed to address the climate change emergency. So understanding the climate crisis not just as one thing, but as shaped by the mitigation, adaptation, restoration, and regeneration um, uh, discourses and agendas really helped to think about how the research agenda was broader um, or could be broader um, than a kind of narrow understanding of what climate change is and does, and that welcomes indigenous perspectives and southern knowledge was one of the critiques raised within um, uh, the literature on research agendas. Something that was missing, which was a notable absence, which we thought from the review, was the way in which the fossil fuel industry itself has been complicit um, in setting the research agenda through direct funding. Um, and we wanted to draw your attention to a very recent paper highlighting the role of the fossil fuel industry within universities. So reflecting on the ways that universities themselves might be um, complicit and actually doing harm was a really important dimension of the research agenda which was missing from our review. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Lorena who's going to talk to you about campus sustainability and governance. The clicker's just there for you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of university responses and very campus-based actions, the evidence that emerged, again, from the range, of, uh, the, the range of articles and the ways in which they discussed and presented and um, potentially critiqued uh, ways in which campuses uh, were adapting to the challenge of climate change came across in, in various different ways through the, through the systematic review. There was, there tended to be a focus on the built environment, perhaps a, a, a much more than the social and, and kind of discussion-based critiquing environment. So the built environment itself of the campus through studies that focused on, you know, reducing uh, computer usage, reducing electricity usage. So very, very targeted, um, kind of statistic-based numbers, how do we reduce energy use in, in uh, dorms, in, in student dormitories, and things like that. So there was a, that focus on the built environment, which raised kind of a broader uh, discussion and, and broader kind of insight into what we call kind of greening efforts. And these greening efforts tend to be kind of an, um, an umbrella term, as in uh, a, a, a specific intervention or a specific initiative to reduce energy was lumped under this kind of greening, overall greening effort. And so I think discussing something like greening initiatives, greening efforts, I think it's important as some of, the, as some of these articles did, which is to kind of dig into what exactly do we mean by those? What do those greening efforts look like? What do they address? How are we measuring them? How are we discussing them? And how are these kind of continuing to adapt to the ongoing challenges? So there was, again, that focus as well on adaptation and mitigation and less so on transformation and the regeneration that Charlie just mentioned. So largely speaking, it was discussing things as they are and much less so as they might be and as they could be uh, adapted and, and um, perhaps improved or enhanced. So again, as I discussed, some of the evidence was uh, very, very kind of small scale studies on single universities and some of them are doing kind of cross-country comparative studies involving multiple campuses, countries, and looking at, in a way, the evidence and how that collaboration and that collaborative learning can happen. So kind of think, and this is kind of a, 
overused term, but kind of a best practice approach of how are other campuses adapting to the challenges, what can we learn from those? And so in that way, so some of those kind of cross-context con cross studies uh, provided a bit more kind of a, of a, of a broader look at how, how the very, very local responses could apply, a very campus local responses could apply to other campuses, perhaps. And the, in terms of kind of impact and those models, the institutional efforts were, it really, they have to be considered on, on those different levels. It can't kind of, again, be seen as just campus sustainability as a thing that every campus as a general rule could follow. There's not a single template or a, sim a single way to approach campus sustainability. Rather, they have to be considered, or, or as the evidence suggests, um, they are and can be and would benefit from being considered as very nationally, regionally, and institutionally situated. So considering the institution in context, the specific needs and problems of that context has to be taken into account. And there were, um, in terms of kind of sustainability, uh, embedded within that was specific efforts by student, there were articles, there were a, a handful of articles that focused on activism, so student activism. They, these were in Global North context, but um, were focused on di uh, divestment, but they, the authorship and sort of the kind of drivers behind the, that research um, came from the activists themselves, which was quite an interesting finding. And it, it, I guess it kind of looking at the range of it, the fact that there weren't that many articles is bring, raises some, some interesting questions as well. And governance then as a response was something that is a bit more abstract and a bit more difficult to kind of tease out the specific um, issues that, and, and, and how governance as a response is contributing towards um, climate change, um, sorry, uh, the responses. And so in, in largely across the articles, they were seen as more institutional commitments and policies. So not, not a, a whole lot of kind of dialogue across um, perhaps communities, countries, regions, but more the, the, the evidence showed a lot more institutionally based governance. And these were framed through the specific action plans within universities, what they, uh, many of the, of the articles focused on what the, these, these are called CAPs. So the climate action plans and different ways of sustainability reporting. So different universities had different approaches to this. So this is what kind of the evidence was raising was how different regions, how different um, universities were choosing to report on it. Um, showed also kind of a, a variance there. And they, again, these were framed in different ways. So it was framed as reporting efforts, it was framed as support systems, it was framed as caps, but largely kind of they were all speaking about the same thing. And that, again, the, the wider debate around governance also tended to kind of focus on mitigation and then uh, to a lesser extent adaptation. Again, speaking about their commitments and, and actual institutional policies um, about climate change. And Again, when we were looking at the evidence and thinking of these, these gaps and these ways to bridge kind of ideas, um, what was evident, what it was, it was, what was evident were, were those concerns about mitigation adaptation. However, there was a dearth of attention, again, the, the issues that Charlie raised, the issues I just raised a little bit about that transformation, the, the governance practices in universities, it was very much kind of presented we could, we could argue that it was presented as a, a more of a static picture with less discussion and less attention towards the evolving process and ongoing debate and discussion that, that I think we're talking about today and in the context of, of an, an event like this in the context of COP. And so while the systematic review was you know, bringing forth all of these things, we're very much still in the process of figuring out you know, where, how, what, what evidence, what, results from the, and the discussions from the systematic review are going to contribute further to the, to the debate. So. Thanks, Lorena. So finally, we were just looking at questions of outreach and extension. 
Um, and these pick up lots of the ideas of the just transition theme that we've been talking about today. So there were some articles reflecting on the relationship between universities and industries and some of the actions that happened. And what for us was really interesting and, and kind of picks up some of the discussions that we were having in the business breakfast this morning is that there's a lot of work being done, but there's not necessarily a lot of documentation of that work. And so that's um, one of the kind of um, key encouraging uh, ways that we would uh, take forward or a recommendation from the systematic review is for all of the different people doing work around this is to, is to document that work and to share that work so that we can support this mutual exchange um, between different stakeholders and between different institutions. Um, within the work looking at outreach extension, there was a focus on the role of students of students as bridging actors, both within their communities from home, the communities that they come from, and then also to the world of work as they transition out of university. Um, and there were ideas about usable science, about academia moving out of the kind of ivory tower and of tertiary education um, as being integrated into um, social networks, social capital societies in the ways that we've been talking about a lot today as well as some ideas about universities and higher education institutions as leaders within the community, as being looked to as examples um, for sustainability and questions of environmental literacy, not just through raising awareness, but through practice-based and experience-based work. Um, and partnerships between mm. universities and schools was, of, a, of, a, of course, a really important theme. So broadly speaking, in the uh, systematic review, what was kind of missing from a lot of the research was a justice lens, whether explicitly or implicitly. And we felt that that was something that um, could be really worked up to think about the theories behind the work that we do, to try and understand why we do what we do, um, was something missing from, from some of the articles. So that's the systematic review. I'm now going to turn to introducing our survey because another dimension of our work is to think about how students themselves understand the role of the university. So not just how the academic literature frames it, not just the debates within the work that's been written about, but how students understand the practices and experiences and attitudes associated with climate change. Um, and so what we've done in the survey is um, we've surveyed at the moment about 1,500 students in Kenya and in Brazil each, so about 3,000 in total. And the survey is still being rolled out in Mozambique and in Fiji across 12 different universities across those different contexts. And the predominance of the survey is with undergraduate. It's only with undergraduate students. So what we want to understand is the relationship between the different dimensions um, of practices, experiences, and attitudes. So I'm going to hand over to Kate now, um, who's going to introduce you to some of our uh, methods and our questions and talk about the difference between them and also some of the emerging findings from the survey. Hi, I'm Kate. Um, I'm a master's student at UCL. Um, so I just, as Charlie said, I'm just going to talk you very briefly through some of the findings from our survey and just give you a little bit of context for the questions that we're asking. And what we're trying to capture, as Charlie has said, is students' attitudes towards both normative and actual aspects of climate change relating to the university. So if you can see these uh, the survey has three parts. The first part is uh, a demographic uh, understanding of, um, of students, so gender, age, course that they're taking at the university. The second part relates to the university. So on the screen here, you can see some of the questions. So the first question at the top, number one, captures normative aspects of the survey. So for example, um, whether universities should have a climate change policy. The second type of question relates to actual uh, policies and practices of universities. So whether universities, for example, have 
climate change policy. Um, the reason we are asking these questions, as Charlie says, is to try and understand students' attitudes towards climate change and universities' role in that as well. So the third part of our survey is relating to environmental attitudes, so climate change in particular, but also um, the environment more broadly. So here is a, an example of the questions that were asked as part of this survey at the top. <coughs> So, as Charlie said, these are emerging findings and our work is still ongoing as part of the, uh, the survey. We are working with four partners, so um, Fiji and Mozambique, the survey is still open there. But these are some of our findings from Kenya and Brazil. So, I just want to draw your attention specifically to the yellow bar, which is agree. So, as you can see, students in Kenya largely agree that coverage of climate change in the curricula that's covered is helping them to understand the urgency of the climate crisis. The picture in Brazil is a little bit more mixed, as you can probably see there. So what we're seeing, and you will see here as well, it's a, a similar question, is that students in Kenya do agree that climate change is covered by teachers as part of the curriculum, but also it's addressed not in a siloed way necessarily, but across different, different subjects. <coughs> Again, the picture from Brazil is a bit more mixed here. What we're finding quite interesting from this survey is that I just want to draw your attention here to Brazil is that while Brazilian students, for example, do not feel that, that climate change is covered as a topic within their curriculum, there, there is a, a strong... Uh, Brazilian students are, are very interested in climate change and they want to see more coverage of that within their curriculum. And I will show you also here, the same is true in Kenya, despite the fact that many students already feel that this is covered, they still want to learn more about it, as you can see from the dark blue bar there. So most students that we have, that, that our results coming from this survey is that um, in contexts where students feel that they are already learning and not learning enough, students still want to learn more about it. So we feel that this is very positive. Um, Charlie, I'm going to hand over, Charlie's going to talk about how these results are feeding into the participative um, action. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So why do a survey? That's one of the things that we just want to end with. Um, not only to understand students' attitudes, but actually to translate what students want from their university into meaningful change and meaningful action. So that's one of the things that our colleagues in Kenya are now working to do. Through participatory research that brings together um, colleagues from county and national governments, colleagues from community-based and indigenous organizations, students themselves, administrators, managers, and lecturers, through participatory research in which the different kind of questions around how to transform the curricula are discussed, our colleagues in Kenya are aiming to review and to change and to redefine the curriculum responding to these student wishes. And I just want to end with um, a reflection from one of our participatory group meetings in which they said, in the past, there's been weak collaboration between universities and local communities in relation to mitigation and adaptation. Universities have largely ignored the indigenous ways that communities have already used to mitigate and adapt to climate change related issues in their research and community engagements. So through this process of dialogue and participatory research, we're aiming to kind of try and challenge some of those dominant hierarchies, both in terms of knowledge and also in terms of the ways um, that universities work. Um, so that's um, our project. I think in lots of different ways, it probably raises more questions than it answers. 
um, because we're only halfway through. So we're looking forward to sharing lots more of the findings of the project, particularly of the participatory research. Um, and this afternoon, um, our colleagues from Brazil will talk a little bit more about some of the work that they're doing there um, in two of the different institutions in Brazil. But thank you very much for your attention and again um, for uh, uh, the focus of this day, which we think is so important. Okay, colleagues, now you've been uh, very patient uh, for some significant time, so we're going to have a quick break. We are going to have lunch at 12.15, but I'm going to suggest a 10-minute break. We come back at 10 to 12, and we'll have 25 minutes looking at the conversations and discussions that we've had this morning. So 10 to 12, see you then.
Right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I will invite some questions or points on the, the, the panel and reflections on the panel and also from, from Ken and Paul, who are still online. Can I try and encourage any questions or, or points that you would like to make in the audience today? Ah, ah, here we go. We've got two hands. Could you start by telling us who you are, if you would like? You don't have to, but you could. Uh, is there a microphone, or are we just asking you to... to oh, here we go. We've got lights as well. Ah, here's the microphone. Hello. Hello. Does that work? Yep. Okay. Um, I thought the presentation about the systematic review was fantastic. I'm involved with primarily school education, but also have some connection into uh, university involvement, kind of the bridging actor group, I suppose. Um, the one thing I did think was missing from the systematic review was um, privilege. The community at university is obviously associated with high emissions just because of their demographic. Is there something that popped up around that in your review? So, thank you. I, I, I probably should have mentioned, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, I probably should have mentioned that the way that we conceptualized university responses to the climate crisis, um, we were thinking about universities contributing positively. But as part of the broader systematic review report, which will be a working paper in our series eventually, um, we thought about all of the different ways in which universities themselves are part of um, what many colleagues have called the polluter elite. So the ways in which universities themselves contribute to global emissions, um, both directly through student and academic mobility. We're a highly mobile population. Um, also through um, historical um, forms of extractive growth, um, feeding directly into fossil fuel industries, and the ways in which universities themselves are implicated in colonial forms of um, injustice associated with climate change, absolutely as part of the discussion. Um, but what we were interested in terms of our systematic review is how universities can contribute positively, so the evidence for that. Um, but I think the ways in which privilege plays into that and the ways in which power and dynamics of power, both between um, the global north and the global south and also between um, different kinds of universities in the ways that we've been talking about today, different forms of, of, of tertiary education is absolutely part of, of the broader picture. Um, and that's really important. So yes, absolutely, thank you for raising it. And I suppose just on, on the back of that, have you any comments on what you see in terms of institutions selling them, using their, using their green credentials to sell themselves, as it were? So there's a really interesting paper by some colleagues in Cardiff which analyze university sustainability statements um, and talk about the ways that those don't necessarily translate into action. So universities, in part of the ways that universities are often um, uh, kind of critiqued and measured, um, we have sustainability trackers, the Times Higher Education has one. There are lots of different ways in which universities' um, sustainability metrics and statements are becoming part of the way to evaluate the extent to which a university is a good university. Um, but the way that that actually translates from these statements of sustainability to action is, is a source of concern. Um, so Bryony Latter and Stuart Capstick's work on this is really good, highlighting how, um, how universities can actually move beyond these kind of statements to actual concrete work on the ground. And that's what we're trying to do through our participatory action research as well. We're trying to do not just research, but actually action um, generated um, through local encounters. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's a really important shift in the ways that universities should work, or it should be a shift in the ways that universities should work. Okay, thank you. A comment, there's another hand at the top. 
somewhere. Oh, it's down, oh, I beg you, is it? Yeah, I think it was yourself, yes. <laughs> My question was going to be about um, accessibility for a diverse population. But maybe it's a localised question about Glasgow and Scotland. How do we make sure that education or initiatives reach um, members of all communities, SIMD10 communities, racially diverse communities? Well, I'll let Paul Little answer that because he will anyway. So um, let's <laughs> go on, Paul. Um, thanks for that uh, comment. I, I think, um, well, we already are doing that. Um, 40% of the students at this college come from Glasgow and 60% come out with Glasgow. Um, so in many ways, you know, how do you define Glasgow? Is it Greater Glasgow? Or is it Central Glasgow? Um, I think to Charlotte's point and, and to my original point about leaving no one behind, which I think talks to your question, is if you take the, the number of uh, girls and women and young people in the planet, uh, that's 75% of the population. So the conversations tend to be dominated by white male elite uh, from the global north. Mm -hmm. So e even actually uh, surfacing the problem is, is, is a key part of the solution. And I think in what we're trying to address in general is we should see this as a, an opportunity, not an obligation. Uh, so it's an opportunity to help many more people uh, access education and I think the work that we're doing at this college in the senior phase in schools, that kind of blurring between the senior phase in schools and the first two years in college where some of, for example, the units that we do in higher education, we offer in schools and in partnership with schools. That, that provides not just a taster, but that provides uh, an enabler for young people to say that actually tertiary education is for me because in many ways they're very confident in their environment in schools um, but to take that next step, to go on to that, be they a, a, a student in a school or indeed be they a new citizen, they, they need to see themselves as belonging. They need to see themselves as being comfortable in that space. But you'd expect me to say, you know, that City of Glasgow College and a whole ream of statistics that can rhyme off is very much at the centre of that. I mean, you don't get to a college of 40,000 students if you, if you only teach the elite. Now, we have two questions beside, uh, beside each other, as it were, and, and there's one last one down here, and then we'll come back to, the, uh, to Ken and Paul online. Yes? Okay, it's Janet Brown. I'm a non-executive director, and I'm just very interested in skills. And I suppose one of the things that um, it touches on all of the speakers this morning, um, universities are traditionally a three-year long course, um, and a lot of the stuff that I think we're gonna be looking at needing is that transition from one uh, occupation to another. Um, in your research and in and the comments from the other speakers today, has there been any thought put to changing the way universities approach um, long courses and actually start focusing, as Paul has said this morning, on short, sharp things that allow people to transition into new industries or to, to, to fill the skills gaps that they will have as they move into new jobs? So I suppose uh, Janet's point is, from the from the research that you're doing, are you seeing the evolution in the institutions to uh, live up to the challenges that uh, uh, the the move towards um, tackling the climate challenge brings? We in, in the systematic review we saw some, but I probably would say not enough. Um, and so for universities where there is a focus on on green skills and on those skills for a just transition um, our kind of encouragement would be that there was more evidence around what that looks like and how that happens um, there is some so for example joy mentioned the MOOC the the short massive online course is a very different way of teaching than the kind of university um, kind of three-year courses so there are kind of more um, diverse ways of teaching um, and delivering information and delivering knowledge and engaging with communities. Um, I think I would again draw attention to the work as well that some of the research is doing and talking about in relation to partnerships with industry 
where it might be within a longer course, there was a much shorter course which was focused on practice-based or experience-based or um, labour market-based skills where um, business leaders came together to work with students to design a project um, where they would then go and do something like an apprenticeship. So that was part of the kind of broad review. Um, and then in, in our research in Mozambique, for example, industry is one of the partners for the participatory action research. So thinking about the ways that different people can collaborate in different ways um, to transform the knowledge systems. So I think we probably think about skills, but we also think about skills in relation to knowledge, knowledge skills and values. So that kind of bigger system that skills sit within. Um, but we absolutely agree that that, that kind of model of, of elite three year um, uh, kind of focus it, it isn't just um, whether you're talking about social justice or climate justice, it, it's not fit for purpose. Um, and, and that's something that we are thinking about, but I think more needs to be done. Um, and it's not something that has been the direct focus of our uh, any of our desk-based research. Um, so we've done some work on kind of climate literacy or environmental literacy, but not necessarily on skills directly. Um, and so today's been really thought-provoking for us and this whole partnership with the City of Glasgow and seeing how the college works has been really interesting for, for us to raise new avenues of thinking. Good. I might, I might add that City of Glasgow College is a powerhouse school. Mm. And if you think that the World Economic Forum said their estimate is that within the next eight years, one billion members of our population across the world need re need reskilling. That's not upskilling, that's reskilling. The need for skills is becoming front and centre. So I think uh, next generation institutions like City of Glasgow College need to be replicated globally. Two last questions. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So my name is Nicolas, um, and I work at, here at City of Glasgow College. I wanted first to prize you for bringing the importance of having indigenous representation in those communities who are at the front line of the climate emergency. Um, uh, I think that that's very, very important because they have been dealing with climate change, not now, if not for several years now. Um, the question I have for you is about your systematic review. I think w we've seen you have been asking students. My question is, um, have you asked also lecturing staff? Because a lot of these changes will need to be enabled by those uh, educators and sometimes more, for example, now with the pandemic, their capacity might be quite stretched. So, and every single person is in a different stage in this sustainability learning journey. So we need to kind of build capacity for them and support them. Okay. Lecturers. <laughs> Um, so that wasn't, so what we've presented on today is stage one of a multi-stage um, process. The working package diagram that I showed is actually a flow of work that's part of the research design. So stage one has been to do this desk-based research to find out the evidence that already exists and to speak to students about what their views are. Stage two is, yes, exactly, to speak to staff and to speak to managers and people within the broader university kind of um, anatomy, the kind of broader system. Um, so we have a number of qualitative interviews with members of staff that are currently being conducted um, and also with community-based um, organisations and indigenous groups who are participating in the participatory research. So the participatory research groups both design an action and implement it, but also reflect on the own, their own knowledge, their own value systems, what they themselves bring to that process. Um, so they both are kind of agents of change, but also researched into understanding their underpinning values. Um, so it's absolutely part of it. I think your question, though, also raises a really important point that we were talking about. Ketan made some really lovely comments in relation to um, 
Paul's paper um, that was the first session around this idea of a just transition is going to look very different in very different contexts. So you were talking about transition to and transition from. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Ketan. The question was, is there an implicit or tacit uh, understanding that all of the communities are at the same place? And is there a tacit assumption about where we want to go? Is the destination same for all of us? And so there might be communities, or rather there are communities which are not at the same same place, and, uh, a, and they, they would have different ideas and different understandings regarding <coughs> where they want to go and how they want to uh, go there. So, the idea of just transition in order to, to be just would also require to look at <clears throat> transition from and transition to. And that would mean a very radically contextualized understanding of that transition rather than uh, a very homogeneous kind of one, one shoe fits all uh, understanding. Okay. Last question, and then we go back to uh, the two Pauls and Ken for one last comment. Uh, thank you. I'm a member of Glasgow College's regional board. My background is in health, so I bring a health lens to this, and I think no one can deny that it's also a health crisis that we face uh, through the climate uh, crisis as well. Um, and first of all, I have to say I, I really do um, appreciate that we are in that meso-exo zone, and I think it's a very important zone, and, and we shouldn't forget that. In the world of public health, we talk about um, a, you know, the understanding, predicting, and controlling. And actually, traditionally, a lot of public health research, maybe 90% or more, sits around the understand and predict, and very little towards the control end. Until, of course, you get COVID, and you realize how rapidly we went from understand, predict, and control vaccines, all the different things have been put in place. So I would like to think that you know, we learn something from the speed with which that went into this climate emergency. Um, and I think actually, I'm going to be controversial here, and I think that colleges are a bit closer to the control element that universities might be. I think universities are still understanding and predicting, and that's a good thing. But um, you know, I think you, you talked about uh, things <coughs> as they are and things as how they might be. And so I have a, co a question actually, one both to uni and to colleges to say, you know, how might universities speed up their approach to, you know, the regeneration transformation active, you know, how things might be. In other words, how might universities be more college? Uh, and for colleges, I'd be saying, how do colleges in Glasgow, across Glasgow, um, intend to speed up their ability to bring control? I guess it's in the re realms of SMEs and all those connections that we have. But I, I would emphasize to all parties, think about how we're going to speed up and intensify and increase the proportion of time, effort and money that goes into control. Okay, I'm gonna ask those, that very question, if I may, to uh, both Pauls and, and Ken. Ken, I'm, I'm minded that in your presentation, you, you're clearly uncomfortable as to where you think COP will land. So my question to the three of you is, what will make COP successful in your, uh, in your mind, particularly given the, the discussion we've had today, and I think the point about uh, how do we speed up as well. So Ken, why don't, we have, uh, why don't we have your final comments first? Well, I, I think that the best response to COP, whatever the outcomes, is a determination to accelerate the just transition and to play, and for each organisation individual to play the rightful role. I just want to make a few responses to the discussion that's just gone. I do think we have to reconceptualise knowledge and skills. There is an ancient academic vocational divide which is even more redundant now than it's ever been. And I think we have to look at the relationship between those because we, we, are, we have to use the crisis to produce entirely new types of, of, of knowledge and skill. So it's a paradigm shift, I think, very important. Secondly, as far as access is concerned to the just transition, we have to remember that certainly in England, that lifelong learning provisions taking step backwards over the last decade or more. And so I think it's very, very important that lifelong learning is reconceptualized too and placed 
at the center of the educative mission in, in what I've called the meso and exozones. And working with Barking and Dagenham, we've begun to discuss concepts called citizens pathway, citizen pathways, how people get involved in both provision and work and have a constant, as it were, pathway of provision. And in this, we are looking to relate three things, to relate, relate the way people work in new ways, the way people live in new ways, and the way people learn in new ways. So working, living, and learning becomes this new kind of paradigm of experience uh, for citizens. And I think we've got to think of that level in particular, uh, which also then links uh, our own populations with those in the Global South. Thank you. Paul Granger, what will make COP26 a success for you? I think what's emerging is that COP is identifying the barriers. And I think that's an important first step, identify the barriers towards the global transition, and then you can work on them one at a time. And I just want to be parochial and talk about one that's near to my heart, which is that it is difficult to be green if you're poor. And that poverty is a major barrier, and Ken picked this up in, in, in his paper, poverty is a major barrier to transition. Just to come back down to Scotland, um, um, one, one of the ways of alleviating poverty is access to skills. And I think Paul was far too modest about the role of Glasgow College in bringing more people into some form of skill set. Um, in the UK as a whole, colleges are responsible for more uh, class mobility, social mobility than any other institution um, because they have no barriers to entry. Um, even within universities, we have barriers to entry, people are turned away. When people are turned away, they're more likely to suffer from poverty. Um, further education is an inclusive institution. You can't replicate it around the world because there are, in TVET ar around the world, there are many, many different approaches to vocational education and training. And it's only really in the English speaking world that you have something that's recognizable as an FE college. In Japan, for example, most vocational education and training goes through apprenticeships. So there will have to be different solutions in different countries. But there is no doubt that people who are excluded from skills are excluded from employment. They're therefore condemned to poverty. They cannot play their role in greening the economy. Excellent, thank you. I had to write that down, far too modest. That's a first ever for Paul Little. Um, uh, anyway, um, Mr. Little gets the last word as that's usually best, I find. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. I think um, I said earlier on, it's, it's important that no one should be left behind. Uh, and I think in, in the status game that we play, and that really speaks to Ken's point about, you know, these kind of ancient divides between the academic approach, which has dominated, uh, and it hasn't always dominated, but certainly dominated in the last five years, um, 50 years, sorry. Uh, I think the, the challenge is we, we need to move to a world where instead of getting ahead, we prioritize getting along and we get along together. And I think colleges like City of Glasgow College, where there's 150 different languages spoken at this institution, there's 2,000 courses, there's 40,000 students. Um, the reality of the situation is everyone is welcome at City Glasgow College. And when I was um, talking about the divide between further and higher education, when you only talk about that bifurcation, you don't talk about lifetime learning, nor do you talk about early years learning, nor do you talk about you know, all the other learnings that, that are go in the ecosystem. So Ken's point, about taking a, a systems approach is one that I fully endorse. And, and to your point about, you know, should universities become more like colleges and college more like universities? Well, probably no, because the reality situation is universities have got particular strengths and are great niches and colleges have great strengths and niches. But actually, it shouldn't just be about one and then the other. It should be the whole system of specialist institutions. Look, we're not talking about the you know, the, the specialist, small specialist institutions in higher education that we have here in Glasgow and the Conservatoire and the School of Art, and we're not talking about our Gaelic speaking colleges and so forth. So the, the reality of the situation is, you know, we, we are looking 
to our governments and we're looking to our society to to support the work that we're doing here. You're, you're, you're confident the control of the mechanisms are symbiotic relationship with business, the faster uh, skill and upskilling and reskilling, the uh, advent of real micro credentials. Let's not go for 100 hours of learning, let's go for 20 hours of learning. The clue is in the word micro in that sense. But also it, it takes um, a whole system to make this work. It takes the funding council, it takes the Scottish government or UK government or global governments. It takes the uh, education leaders, it takes the academics on the grounds, it actually takes the, the voice of the student and the student participation and the wider stakeholders, be they the business leaders or civic society, all to want to be getting along together. And I think, um, you know, the question, Mike, you said is what will make uh, COP a success? COP 26 is already a success for Glasgow because the world is in Glasgow seeing Glasgow as a city and institutions in Glasgow being innovative across a wide spectrum of civic society. And today they are seeing and hearing that that is very successful in tertiary education and very successful in skills and very successful in inclusion and very successful in social justice. And you, you couldn't buy that global platform I hope it's not a, another 400 years before they come back. Very good. On that point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's lunchtime. Lunch is where breakfast was if you joined us for breakfast, and we will see you there. Would you take a, a moment just to thank all our speakers again this morning, the two Pauls, Ken, Charlie, and our team. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for coming back. I hope you have enjoyed the lunch. Um, my name is Nicolas. I'm COP26 project advisor here at City Glasgow College. I'm also the former student president. Um, and it's my honor to introduce the next speaker. Um, her name is Narubia Huerreira. Uh, she comes from the Inya Caraja people, an indigenous tribe located in Brazil. She comes all the way from the Amazon, and with her, she carries a reminder to those in the global north and beyond. A reminder of how damaged our collective home is. A reminder of what is really important in life and where we really belong. We have one collective home that we must protect. And indigenous people are at the forefront line protecting the rainforest that give home to more than the 80% of the global biodiversity of our planet. They protect nature and at the same time they protect us. Please everyone welcome Narubia Huerreira. A big applause to her and a big applause to the Amazon. Awiri. É um cumprimento na minha língua nativa. Awiri. Awiri is a complete, is, it is a salvation of my native language. É uma grande honra estar aqui. Eu agradeço ao grande espírito. It's a great honor to be here. I thank to the great spirit. É uma grande responsabilidade representar o meu povo. Eu agradeço à mãe terra. It's a great responsibility to represent my people. I thank the mother earth. Eu agradeço o convite. I think I am appreciated by the invitation. E todos vocês que estão aqui para ouvir. And all of you that are here today to listen. Muito obrigada. Thank you so much. Eu estive na floresta nativa aqui há três horas de Glasgow. I have been in the native forest here three hours of Glasgow. E eu falei com um nativo que conversou comigo falando Gaelic. And I have spoken with a native people in here that have spoken with me in Gaelic. E ele contou toda a dor do coração dele. And he told me all the, his heart pain. E nós choramos juntos. And we cried together. E nós nos alegramos juntos. And we enjoy together. Porque somos portadores talvez da última mensagem. Because we have maybe the last message to give to you. Eu espero que não. I hope not. Eu espero que realmente essa mensagem chegue nos corações das pessoas e se levantem como guardiões naturais da floresta. I hope that message gets to the heart of every people and these people rise up as guardians of the forests. Porque a me o mesmo pensamento que destruiu todas as florestas nativas aqui está destruindo as florestas do Brasil. Because the same thinking that have destroyed the forest in here are destroying the forests in Brazil. E matando os povos nativos. And killing the indigenous people. E estuprando as nossas mulheres. And raping our women. E massacrando o nosso povo. And killing our people. Por isso, mais importante do que o que está acontecendo na COP. For that reason, the one subject most important of instead of what is happening in the COP26 
é as conexões paralelas e instituições de ensino como essa. It is the parallel connections and education institution as this. Os governos não estão preocupados com a questão climática, de fato. The governments are not preoccupied with the climate issues, in fact. Eu estive na COP anterior. I have been in the other COP. São promessas vazias. It are empty promises. Estão negociando nossas vidas. They are negotiating our lives. Estão negociando nosso futuro. They are negotiating our future. Estão negociando a diversidade da vida. They are negotiating our life biodiversity. Porque o pensamento colonizador Because the colonizer thinking é um pensamento de extermínio de toda a diversidade. It's a genocide thinking of all the biodiversity. A diversidade humana, de cultura humana. The human biodiversity of human culture. De cultura agrícola. Of agricultural culture. Vocês não conhecem os frutos do, do mundo inteiro, nem os frutos do Brasil. You don't know the fruits of Brazil and you don't know the fruits of all over the world. Mas eu conheço os frutos de vocês. But I know your fruits. Vocês não conhecem a cultura do mundo inteiro, nem a cultura do meu povo. You don't know the culture of all over the places in the world and not even of my people. Mas eu tive que aprender a cultura de vocês para resistir. But I had to learn your culture to resist. E eu venho aqui, mesmo com todo o And I come here even with all the genocide. Do estupro das nossas mulheres. Of the rape of our women. De ter ouvido que o meu povo é primitivo e selvagem. To hear that my people is primitive and savage. Para oferecer uma aliança. To offer an alliance de religação com a terra. Of reconnection with earth. Porque todos nós somos filhos dela. Because we are all sons of it. Essa é a cosmovisão indígena. This is the indigenous cosmovision. A terra se doa a todo tempo. The earth give itself all over the time. Porque o ser humano se tornou tão egoísta. Because the human being has become so selfish. Dentro dessa lógica Inside this logic, de dominação da terra, of earth domi domination, que é uma visão de consumo, there is a Kantian vision, de dominação dos povos, que é uma visão racista, of people domination, that is a racist vision, de dominação do corpo feminino, que é uma visão machista, of a uh, Domination thinking of the body of women that is a sexist vision. E que vem de um pensamento patriarcal cristão. And it's come from a, an idea of a patriarchal thinking in Christianity. Que, que coloca a soberba humana diante do mundo. That puts the The egocentrism. The egocentrism in all of the world and in people. Sorry. Nós somos só mais um filhos da terra. We are just son of earth as any animals in here. O urso tem direito de viver aqui tanto quanto nós. The bear has the direct to live here as much as we. A onça pintada tem o direito de viver aqui tanto quanto nós. The Jagger as well. Os rios devem ser livres, tanto quanto nós. The rivers has to be free as much as we. É por isso que nós povos indígenas falamos que devemos reflorestar as nossas mentes. There is a reason that we indigenous people uh, speak so much about reforesting our mind. E nos libertar da colonização. And free yourself of colonizing. E do egocentrismo. And of the egocentrism. Da soberba. And of the soberb. 
e nos tornar mais humildes diante da preciosidade da vida. E não estamos aqui para falar que o cristianismo é de todo ruim. Porque a mensagem de Cristo foi de amor. Because the Christ message was of love. Mas eu acho que se esqueceram disso. But I think you forget that. E transformaram isso em consumo. And has transformed it in consume. E dominação. And domination. E eu estou aqui para dizer que nós precisamos com urgência fazer essa união. E só assim, verdadeiramente, conseguiremos mudar as catástrofes que estão vindo e o que o meu povo já falava. Quando os meus anciões falavam, não davam ouvidos a eles. When my, when my elder people spoke, they don't get ear for them. Tem um livro que chama Enterre Meu Coração na Curva do Rio. There is a book that that calls Bury My Heart in the River. Que conta sobre as invasões norte-americanas. That tells about the American invasions. E Toro Pintado, que era um grande líder. And Toro Pintado. Seated Booth. É um grande líder. That is a great leader, indigenous. Falou. Has spoken. Meu coração é vermelho e doce. My heart is red and sweet. Eu sei que ela é doce porque todo mundo que chega perto oferece a sua língua. I know that he is sweet because every people that came near me offered its tongue. Ele falou isso diante do, do governo norte-americano. Conhecendo o pensamento europeu, Knowing the European thought, eu sei que eles acharam ele muito sensível para um chefe. Eu sei que eles pensaram que ele era muito sensível para um chefe. Assim como acham que nós mulheres somos mais fracos porque somos mais sensíveis. As they thought that we women are more weak for being leaders. Mas se não voltarmos a ter sensibilidade humana de fato. But if we can come back to be able to get human sensibility. In, vamos caminhar todos para o precipício. We are going to march to death e sermos responsáveis And be pela maior tragédia the da galáxia, of the galaxy, destruir o mundo inteiro, a whole world. e o universo vai ser testemunha And the will be the, the witness desse grande genocídio, of this big genocide. mas do que depender do meu povo, mas depende do meu povo nós vamos estar em pé lutando. We are going rise up fighting. E esse é o momento de todos nós. And this is the moment of all of us. Que sentimos esse chamado. That feels this call. Lutarmos juntos. Fighting together. Eu acredito nisso. I believe in that. Senão eu não estaria aqui. Or else I wouldn't be here. E eu só estou aqui porque outros acreditaram. And I just hear because other people has believed. O plano do governo brasileiro era exterminar todos os povos indígenas. The plan of Bolsonaro government was to kill all indigenous people. E muito antes do Bolsonaro. And way far of Bolsonaro. Teve uma conferência no final do século XIX na Inglaterra. It has a conference in the, in the, in the 19th century in England. Que espalhou teorias do que espalhou teorias do darwinismo social. That has spread theories about social darwinism. 
e alguns médicos brasileiros participaram. E alguns médicos e alguns doctors, alguns brasileiros doctors, tinham participado nisso. E o plano era que o povo brasileiro fosse embranquecido. E o plano era que os povos brasileiros fossem mais brancos. Era um plano de embranquecimento racial. Era um plano de mais de integração nacional. Of nation integration. E esse governo traz de novo esses pensamentos. And this government, this actual government brings again the same thoughts. Mas esses pensamentos estão voltando no mundo inteiro. But these thoughts are back in, in the whole world. Um dos pensamentos responsáveis pelos maiores atrocidades que nós já vimos da humanidade. A thought that is responsible for one of the biggest tragedies that we have ever, already seen in the whole humanity. Hoje no Brasil, nós líderes indígenas e ativistas ambientais corremos risco de vida. Today, we Brazilian activists run risk of life in Brazil. Os índices de desmatamento e de fogueiras aumentaram sobremaneira a mais de 20%. The deforestation and the burning has increased more than 20%. As invasões das terras indígenas, o garimpo ilegal, estão por toda parte, de norte a sul do país. The native people, the invasions of native people lands and the miners, the invasions of miners has spread all, all, all over Brazil, to Princi north, uh, uh, south. Principalmente no norte e a Amazônia. Mostly in the north and the, in the Amazon rainforest. O Pantanal. The Pantanal. O Cerrado. O Cerrado, the Cerrado. E todos os nossos biomas. And all our biomes. Isso nos afeta primeiro. This affects us first. Mas vai afetar todo o Brasil. But we will affect all Brazil. E vai afetar todo o mundo. And we will affect all over the world. Porque tudo está ligado. Because everything is connected. Mas eu acredito que nós podemos mudar isso. But I believe that we can change that. Porque tudo é energia. Because everything is energy. Prótons, nêutrons, elétrons. Prótons, nêutrons, elétrons. Nada é estático. Not, nothing is static. Todo o sistema é construído através da política que acontece através da palavra. Every system is based on a word, on a word. E a palavra tem poder. And the word has power. A maior ilusão criada pela palavra foi o dinheiro. The most illusion has already been created by the word was money. Onde se ter é melhor do que ser. Well, have money is better, is better of, instead of being a human being. Ser. Being. Being. Oh. <laughs> e hoje, você... Ah. E hoje nós podemos, juntos, pensarmos diferente e começarmos a fazer todas essas ligações mentais para transformar a nossa vida individual e isso afeta as pessoas que estão ao nosso redor. And today we can change that. We can change our mind to to not affect people in every area. Foi assim que aconteceu todas as transformações na história. It was in that way that uh, happened all the transformations in history. Os poderosos nunca cederam. The, the powerful people never have ceded. Foi sempre uma transformação do povo. It was always a change by the people. Da juventude. Of the youth. De estudiosos. Of the students. Uma união. A union. De acreditar quando muitos não acreditam que é possível. To believe when almost everyone believe that is not possible. Mas é possível porque não era para eu estar aqui, não eram para mulheres votar, não eram para existir uma democracia se fosse a vontade dos governos da terra. But it is possible because it wasn't supposed to me be here to woman get be able to vote 
if it depends of the governments of the earth. E nós povos indígenas somos a última fronteira verde da terra. And we indigenous people are the last green frontier of all over the earth. Agora eles estão procurando colonizar outros planetas. Now they are looking to colonize other planets. Um atestado da loucura da soberba humana. A demonstration of craziness, of egocentrism of the human being. Mas aqueles que realmente amam a diversidade da vida. But they that really love the biodiversity of life. Voltem para a terra. Came to the earth. Voltem para a natureza. Came to the nature. Vão para os campos. Go to the fields. Sinta isso. Feel that. Tenha tempo para contemplar. Have time to complain it. Tenha tempo para se conhecer. Have time to know yourself. A nossa essência é natural e não tecnológica e artificial. Our essence is natural, not technological and artificial. Não somos separados da natureza. We are not separated from the nature. Nós somos a natureza. We are the nature. Não existe vida sem natureza. There is no life without nature. Muito obrigada. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, hello. You guys can speak from here, right? Yeah. So, um, here? Okay. Um, we are moving here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this is my first time doing this. So, we are moving to the next speaker, um, Narubi. Yeah? Um, pasamos a la siguiente, eh, es, eh, la siguiente persona. Yes, so with no more delay, I will, well, again, thank you so much for those words, Narvi. So important having you here, so important having indigenous <laughs> representation. Thank you so much, thank you. Oh, and, and thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Gabriel. Actually, Gabriel is one of, uh, he comes from the delegation from Brazil, and uh, with very little time, very, very little notice, he agrees to come here today and he gave a really fair and, and good quality translation to the words of Narubi, which is something really, really important. Um, so we can, thank you, thank you so much, thank you. And with no more delay, I will uh, pass it over to you, Charlie. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, do you have microphone? So. I do. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Um, we're now going to um, invite our colleagues from the University of Pasafundo and the Federal University of Pará to speak about the ways um, in which they're working with different um, forms of knowledges, including indigenous knowledges um, in the Northern Amazonian region. Um, trying to um, answer some of the very difficult and um, very fundamental challenges um, that our colleague has raised. Um, have we got the link? Okay. Sorry? Amanda and the Zoom link. Um, Amanda will speak first. Hi, Amanda, you're live. Hello, thank you very much. Um, can, can I go ahead? Do. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity, this amazing opportunity to present our case in Brazil. 
before Professor Salomon Aji from, from, University, from Federal University of Pará um, joins and present uh, their case there. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of um, the, the Brazilian universities and what they have been doing here in association with the project Climate U. I will quickly share my screen. So I hope you can see it. I guess so. Um, yeah. You can see fine. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Amanda Salvia. I am the research associate of the project Climate U in Brazil. I'm just to present um, a, a big team and an amazing team in Brazil. So we have three partner universities. Professor Salomão is representing Federal University of Pará. Um, we have also a team from University of Sao Paulo in the Southeast region. And uh, I am from University of Passo Fundo in the very South, uh, where our co-investigator of the project is based as well, Professor Luciana Brandi. Uh, well, as you know, uh, Brazil is a huge country with several challenges related to climate change and also with different conditions to allow for actions uh, related to, to climate and to, and to empower um, uh, the communities and also to have in, in relation to education to have students engaged as well. So uh, our participation in, in the project reflects that with different actions in each region. Uh, in, in University of Sao Paulo, for example, they will be working with multidisciplinary projects in several areas. And in my university, we will be implementing, we are implementing an academic her, uh, hub for sustainability and climate action, which is the first green office of uh, Brazil and of South uh, America, uh, an office dedicated to, to these topics. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, at the University of Sao Paulo, the, the, the project is associated with the sector incline, the interdisciplinary climate investigation center, uh, which already focuses a lot and has several projects educational projects around climate. And now yeah, with the project Climate U, they are expanding the, the role of this project because they are applying the, the participatory action research methodology. Uh, and the topic of the, the projects that are being implemented there are, uh, are really rich. Uh, we have um, a great variety of topics, but, but mostly connected with uh, climate education and climate justice, with research and community engagement. And in my university, University of Passo Fundo, uh, we already had some um, actions for sustainability, but they weren't uh, focusing in climate change, in climate action. So we see the, the Green Office uh, uh, approach as an opportunity to focus on that. And also um, as an opportunity to make students more committed to, to get their attention to this topic and be a space that allows for, for their participation as well. Um, and the, the, um, I, I would say the, the the main approach of this green office with the participatory action research is that the, the decisions don't come from a research group or from the university. They come from uh, interdisciplinary meetings with our stakeholders so we can discuss the, the impact, the problems, the challenges, and think together about the, the solutions. So this is the, the approach that we have been applying in, in University of Passo Fundo. So uh, just to, to finish my quick introduction about the project in Brazil, 
uh, as I said, we have many challenges, mostly related to lack of resources, lack of support, change of governance and responsible teams at the, the universities, uh, mainly, that uh, make the, these efforts really diffuse. And um, especially now that we have um, these amazing discussions around uh, climate change, climate action, um, we are happy to, to share these insights with you and in partnership with Climate U to, to be part of this movement of, of change and of climate um, justice. So that's all from me. I will let Professor Salomon Aji to, to present the case of Federal University of Para. Thank you, Amanda. Você está mudo, Salomão. Good morning to everyone. Are you listening me now? We can hear you, Salomão. Good morning. Okay. That's very nice to be here in this international event talking about the Amazon, the the sustainability of the, the, the planet, the world, the environmental issues. I'm very happy to be here, listening the indigenous woman that had speech before me in the Amanda. It's very important to have the indigenous people talking to all over the world. When the colonialists came to America, they said that the indigenous people uh, are primitive people, uncivilized people. And as you could see, it's not true. <clears throat> they are very smart people and their ideas, con conceptions, cosmology is very important for us to continue living in the world. We have so much <clears throat> to, uh, to learn with them. <clears throat> and now, I will start my speech with a poem about the Amazon, trying to say another way of understanding our relationship with the Amazon, with the nature. The next one, Amanda, please. No, the second. Yes, here. The Amazon is not ours. We belong to the Amazon. The colonialists want to own the Amazon and submit the Amazon to its disposal. We are different. We do not want to own the Amazon. We want the Amazon to own us. And we want to be at the disposal of the Amazon. We want to be from the Amazon. We were born from the wombs of the women to live in the bosom of the Amazon. We were born in the womb of the Amazon to live in the bosom of the ancestrality. With our indigenous peoples, with the peasants from the rural areas, people who live on the rivers, extractivists, and black rural people that we call quilombolas. The next, Amanda, please. 
as you can see in the map, the Amazon region is a very huge territory. In the green, you can see what is still in the rainforest. In the yellow is to see how this forestation is coming into the forest. And we need to protect the forest. During this, we are protecting the nature. We are protecting the rivers. We are protecting the humanity. As the indigenous said, there will be no life without nature. And Amazon represents, constitutes the nature that we have, we still have in, in Brazil, in the world. We, we also have another forest. And as, and like to Amazon, we need to protect them if you want to protect the ecosystems, the traditional communities, <coughs> way of life, preserve the forest <coughs> and should be protected as well. I guess it was what the indigenous said to us in her speech. The next Amanda, please. Now you can see uh, a little bit of uh, the Amazon, the largest tropical forest in the world, occupying 60% of the whole Brazilian territory, cradling 20% of the fresh water in the planet, spreading to to many countries and is the home to more than 300 indigenous people, in addition to many other traditional people and communities. The Amazon forest is vital for the Earth's, Earth's climate balance do its ability to absorb carbon from the atmosphere, regulate rainfall and temperature. When someone treats the forest with its deforestation, with the population, the pollution of the rivers, with the forest fires and black illegal mining, impacts, it threatens all humanities. <clears throat> Studies show that the point of no return is approaching when the forest will no longer have to be the capacity to recover itself. So now I will show, I will present to you our um, participatory action research right, was part of the Climate Pool project. Please, Amanda, can you send the other one? Amanda? Okay. So, no, 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 excuse me. So, our goal with the research is to create two collectives of territory governance that we call COGITE in the Amazon of the state of Pará. The first one we call COGITE of Tocantins Amazonia. And the second one, code there of interethnical 
Né? Because we will include quilombola, territory, territory, um, black rural people, and indigenous territory. Né? Our objectives is to gather the preservationist force and strengthen them, gain recognition and establish dialogue between the Cogter and the state owned and private companies in order to find solutions that merge preservation with sustainability. So the Cogite will get together leadership from the rural works labor unions, from fishermen, and people who live on the rivers, black rural communities, and, and also professors and students from the university to be together <coughs> and think collectively solution um, to confront with the environmental impacts that is taking place in this in these territories now. Uh, the collective, oh, can you, sh the next Amanda, please. Oh, here you can see the first one, Cogitaires. Uh, it would be put together leaderships from the countryside, from the six municipalities in the Amazon token things. The next one, Amanda. Please. The next comité interethnico will be will put together indigenous people and black rural people to discuss about their territories, the problems that they are facing with the agro, Hebrew, and mining on enterprise <coughs> right? with the pesticides that they spread along the territory. <laughs> uh, the quality of territory governance will be created in order to face the environmental impacts happening in their respective territories that destroy the biomes and spell the original traditional and peasant people from their communities through disforestation, destruction of the water springs, dissemination of good diggings in rivers, in the intensive usage of agrochemical and pesticides. The impacts have modified the local landscape to the substitution of the forest by pastures or monocultures and the implantation of them and big enterprise linking to mining, the waterways, railroads, and pipelines. They act along with the climate change, bringing forced the rise in global temperature, ecological imbalance, and extinction of many species that constitute our biodiversity. These territories are constantly 
tripling by the implementation of lab, large government and enterprise sector projects with so, social and environmental impacts in their methods of extractiveness. The accumulation of land by large land owners or the absence of public policy that holds the government and large companies for the action, as well as ensure the rights of the indigenous and traditional people to stay in their territories and to affirm the cultures and territories who is their sustainable way of life. The process of construction of the two cogters, we intend to count with the collaboration of representatives of the university, the social movements of the indigenous and traditional people, organisms of political and governmental means, and private state and community companies. Our methodology will be based on pedagogy of alternatives with urgential activities happening throughout the project at the university or at school. We call school time or university and education actions taking place in the community or at the participants' workplace that we call it communities in order to facilitate the participation of social, social movements leaders. That is what we intend to do in our <coughs> PAR, right? participatory action research as part of Climate U projects. Thanks very much. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Has any any anyone has any questions that would like to raise about this presentation? Um, maybe uh, about about Narubia's uh, speech. Um, okay, so we can move on then to the next part in the program. Or sure. Charlie would like. Okay. So. Um we also wanted to um, reflect on the ways in which we can incorporate indigenous knowledges into the university in a very different setting. Um, so we're going to move from thinking about the Brazilian context and the questions um, that Naruvia and, and um, also Salamau and Amanda have raised from Brazil um, to move to the country context of Fiji. So it's two o'clock in the morning, um, but I'm very happy to say that our colleagues in Fiji, as part of their participatory action research, have been making a film which shows you the um, ways of sharing indigenous knowledge through a method called Talanoa. Um, and so we'd like to show you a short film and then two of my colleagues from UCL, um, two MA students, Lucy Page and Rachel G, are going to tell you about the films that they've been watching and the ways in which we in the project think that films can have an educational message, sharing knowledge beyond the walls of the education. My apologies that I'm very much starting to lose my voice, but I hope you've caught all of that. Um, so if we could show the film from Fiji, that would be brilliant. Thank you.
Bulawinaka and greetings from the Fiji Islands. Recently, the University of the South Pacific's Participatory Action Research Group held a series of talanoa with the people of Otutavu in Tavua regarding the experience of climate change. Climate change, according to the people of Watutavui, has brought about destruction to their vanua, and as a result, led to the local extinction of natural resources that they rely on as sources of food, income, knowledge, cultural practices, and maintenance of their vanua. <laughs> Despite the social, economic and health implications of climate change, the people of Atutavui are weaving some indigenous practices with contemporary methods to help them restore and recover some of the resources and traditions they have lost. To foster the recovery and maintenance of the Vanua, the people of Watutavui are appealing to COP26 leaders to firmly commit to themselves in guaranteeing the sustenance of the Vanua. <laughs>
So thank you, everyone. That film um, was made uh, with support from um, an Institute of Education Global Engagement Fund, which is helping us to think about ways to um, communicate about climate education, climate change, um, and to raise um, and um, uh, share knowledge from lots of different perspectives to help us understand that climate change isn't just one thing and is very deeply contextualized and looks very different in very different contexts. Um, for the community from Vatutavui that um, Dr. Lagi was um, sharing uh, some insights from and whose voices we heard, this is the sixth community that they've um, relocated to. So they've been displaced by a number of intersecting inequalities, um, uh, including health um, and, and climate itself. And they're at risk again of sea level, coastal erosion, um, and a number of intersecting factors, as they said, related to disasters, um, as well as kind of social factors associated with climate change. So it's really important for us to think about how climate change looks very different in very different contexts. Um, and my colleagues, Lucy and Rachel, are going to share some thoughts because they, as part of this project, have watched um, a wealth of climate change films. Um, and so we think that um, films about climate change really have the potential, as I hope you saw today, to, to share knowledge and, and ideas across contexts. Yeah. I'll hand over to you, Rachel, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of the wider <laughs> project, we also work with the University of South Pacific. So while we couldn't actually be Sadly, in Fiji, um, we kind of did a lot of the, um, a lot of extra work surrounding it to see where we could support them. So, this was to support the notion of exploring how film can contribute to climate change. And the first was a literature review. So that involved a lot of academic journals, but also more com commercial um, texts as well. And the second was as just to echo Charlotte, we watched a lot of documentaries. Um, and this was quite interesting for us, not just in an academic sense, but also in the way we could actually look at the visuals and what we could recommend um, to put forward for the documentary as well. So for example, one thing we really wanted to um, help push in it was the authenticity to make sure that everything was kept in the individual's mother tongue. And the third aspect was we wrote a blog. So for my specific blog, I was inspired by a documentary that I watched on um, called Losing Alaska. And it's based on New Talk. And, and there's been quite a lot in the news at the moment about this specific town. It's the first town in North America set to be lost due to climate change. And one thing that I found specifically interesting here was um, indigenous knowledge and learning from that um, in relation to the documentary. And it was interesting in the fact that it's the first in the global north. Much emphasis is placed on the global south, yet it is the global north that are actually guilty of producing the most emissions. So it was, it kind of took us down a separate route. And I guess the main focus of that blog post then became the notion of we can use, how can we use documentaries that raise questions of climate change as a problem of here, not just there such as losing Alaska and how that could actually be the solution. Um, that was my main focus. And then Lucy, you also wrote a blog post as well. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I was also reflecting on how climate change films can be used effectively to educate a wider audience about climate justice. So I think we saw from the Fiji film how powerful imagery and storylines can be to communicate to what some of us, for some of us, are quite distant issues such as rising sea levels and other climate issues, and then bringing it and enabling us to see up close and bringing it to our screens can really hit home the urgency of climate change that is already affecting communities to such a drastic extent. Um, so I was reflecting on how these climate change films play with our emotions, because um, if any of you have ever watched a climate documentary, which I'm sure most of you have, you will recognize how it can play with either your hope and your shock. But on the other hand, if, uh, 
climate change films, if the narratives are not crafted in an effective way, it can sometimes leave us in a, paraly a paralyzing state of climate anxiety or despair where we are unsure on what the next actions that can be taken and that's not the lasting message that we want to be leaving after we're creating and showing these climate change films. Ultimately, the climate education is to motivate large-scale climate action that can enact um, tangible change urgently. Um, so upon these reflections of watching both very effective climate films and very ineffective climate films, um, we, uh, we found that there was five things that made for the most effective climate films. Um, and the first of those was to really empower community voices, which I think the uh, University of South Pacific's Fiji film definitely did, because it was allowing um, them to tell their experiences through their own voices and their own stories, um, which in some cases really does disrupt um, the usual narratives that we're used to hearing from um, activists and scientists and academics in the global north. Um, similarly to this, it was to showcase local knowledge and grassroots initiatives. Sometimes um, it can be presented about climate vulnerable communities uh, without showing what these communities are already doing to mitigate their own situations and by um, using film, we can definitely broadcast that to a much wider audience. Then in terms of education, um, climate films, sort of a 10 minute to an hour film, it, it can't um, communicate everything that is needed about climate change. So it was the recognition that this, these types of films should be supplemented with further educational materials. Um, also to target specific audiences. There's definitely, um, a huge potential for film to be communicating the issue of climate change to children and adolescents as well as researchers and also policy makers. And then the last one was to make sure um, that we're bridging the gap between um, our enhanced knowledge of climate change and then actually climate action um, to make sure that we don't just come away with an understanding um, of the issues but also what we can do as individuals and nations and global communities to um, take the next steps to start mitigating the climate emergency. So thank you both. And um, uh, Rosie shared at lunchtime just before she went to bed um, that in response to Lucy's blog and Lucy's insights, the next film that um, the participatory research in Fiji is going to make is a film by children, for children, for use in Fiji secondary schools um, and primary schools um, in partnership with the Ministry of Education there. So we're trying to um, really embody and put into action those multiple um, flows of dialogue and, and understanding. Um, so thank you both. That's all from us. And I'll hand back to Nicholas now. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so now we are moving to the next stage is the student panel. So we have a few students today with us and it's the young panel. And the idea of this is to reflect a little bit about what we uh, heard today, what we learned, and also reflect on um, uh, what means just transition for us. I'm aware that there is in this room very interesting people, organizations who are taking already uh, thinking into action and, and maybe I would love to give the mic to them. Uh, is that okay? Yes. Um, so first of all, I would like to call um, Amazon Planet, uh, Gert, um, Gercom, uh, would you like to come in? I can give it to you. So, Gerd come from um, what? the Amazon and... Hello, uh, I'm from a, a French NGO called Planet Amazon and I am uh, with my two uh, friends, leader, indigenous leaders, can I call them? Is uh, Chief uh, Ninawa from the Amazon, from the state of Acre, Brazil, and Aminda Ibasida from Mexico is an uh, Otomi representative. Come on. Okay. 
Hello. Nice to meet you all. So uh, in my work, so um, Amazon is a French organization that work with indigenous to help them speak with their own words. I don't know in which direction should I say, the, pu the public, yeah. And we are part of a, an alliance that, which is called the Alliance of Mother Nature's Guardians. It's a glo global movement that uh, was created by indigenous peoples with the help of allies, not indigenous ones. So the, the thing is that we don't pretend to help uh, each one another, but to work together to find a just transition for climate change and for many other issues. And the thing is that we are very uh, interested uh, by education issues. I think it would be uh, fine, and it's always the way that I work, to give first uh, the voice to uh, the indigenous representatives, because, you know, they come here to the COP to be heard, and they are not being heard inside the negotiations process. All the negotiators and, and uh, states, they know they are here, but they don't want to listen. They don't want to collaborate with them. So we're happy that you give us that space for them to be heard. Yes. So uh, I'm going to pass word to Chief Ninawa first because he's from Brazil. You talked uh, about Brazil. And Brazil is a very important place for, for the world. We know that there is Amazonia there, but not only Amazonia. There is a lot of uh, um, biospheres, uh, you know, biodiversity space like Pantanal and many other ones, uh, Mata Atlantica, the, the Atlantic forest, etc. So Chief Ninawa from the Uniqui people. Muito boa tarde a todos e a todas. Meu nome é Ninauá, eu sou Rony Queen, sou do estado do Acre, da região amazônica do Brasil. Good, evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ninauá, uh, from the Acre state of Brazil, the Amazon rainforest. É, represento meu povo como liderança do meu povo, também sou presidente na Federação do Povo Rony Queen, que é uma organização específica do meu povo. Também faço parte da Aliança dos Guardiões da Mãe Natureza e também do Conselho de Águia e Condor. I represent my people. I am also president of the of the Eagle and Condor Council. Of of uh, of the Eagle or oh, the the Fepa is, is, is own organization. Federation Uniqui. 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 The Uniqui organization. And I'm very glad to represent my people. And the, in, you talk about the Eagle and Condor Council is part of, and the Alliance of Mother Nature Guardians as well. And yeah. he. Okay. So I can, I can uh, leave. And he's also a member of the Eagle and Condor Council and the, the Alliance of Mother Nature's Guardians. Oi, quero agradecer o convite de poder estar aqui deixando rapidamente uma mensagem, dizer que a educação é de interesse nosso enquanto povos originários. É, mas uma educação que a gente possa estar unindo os dois conhecimentos. I would like to thank everyone for the invitation and spread a message for the education is a very important subject for us, the originarios people, and it's very important to us to have this opportunity. E que a universidade é uma instituição muito importante nesse, em todas as questões é, tanto ambiental enquanto social com as pessoas que são impactadas. And that the university is such an important place for us to discuss about the environmental and the educational uh, subjects uh, because everyone is affected. 
e dizer que nossa a nossa sabedoria ela é milenar a nossa nós temos uma sabedoria transmitido através da natureza com as, os nossos ancestrais recebiam essas educações and i would like to say that our wisdom is through the nature and that our elder people received this wind, this wisdom uh, through the nature e nessa educação em que o nosso povo sempre viveu, tem o respeito com a natureza, a harmonia, a espiritualidade, as artes, a língua. And in this educational thing that our elder people, that our people uh, has received from the culture, the language. E isso nós hoje ainda estamos vivendo na nossa comunidade, vivendo, dando a nossa parcela de contribuição para a preservação e manutenção da diversidade é, cultural, não só cultural, mas também da diversidade humana e do equilíbrio dentro desse planeta. E hoje nós ainda continuamos com isso, para sustentar a nossa contribuição à natureza e ao planeta. Hoje, com essa aliança dos guardiões da Mãe Natureza, em que nós fazemos parte do Conselho de Água e Condô, nós estamos falando da fazendo uma reeducação da humanidade de se reconectar com a natureza para verdadeiramente compreender o processo de preservação de cuidar é, a, da, da nossa biodiversidade que temos dentro do planeta. Today with uh, these organizations that I have been part, uh, it's very important to articulate about the conservation of the biodiversity of our planet. Nós temos é, estou vendo agora de um outro evento aonde nós fizemos a leitura de uma declaração é, de um encontro de povos indígenas do mundo inteiro, principalmente lideranças é, que estão fazendo suas conexões espirituais, essa declaração da ideia de como cuidar da natureza. I'm coming now from another event from uh, where we have wrote Uh, a declaration of all indigenous people in the world about the importance, the importance of the preservation and the conservation. Dizer que é, eu lancei uma petição há dois meses atrás, fazendo uma convocação à juventude, à juventude principalmente europeia, em poder se juntar à luta é, dos povos indígenas nessa preservação. And I would like to say that I have that I have launched a petition to demonstrate to the European youth to aggregate uh, with us with this fight. E também estamos lançando um convite à União a, a, ao Parlamento Europeu a trabalhar uma coalizão entre sabedoria de povos originário e a, 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 o Parlamento Europeu para poder também a gente discutir alternativas é, voltado mais para os conhecimentos tradicionais de como orientar a cuidar também da natureza. And also I would like to send an invitation for the European Parliament to make a coalition for us to see the indigenous people views. E para finalizar, dizer que nós estamos vivendo mais uma COP, a 26ª Conferência das Partes. And to finish, I would like to say that we are living the COP26. Que são, é, assim, no meu ponto de vista, estou sempre dizendo isso, que são conferências que não estão verdadeiramente fazendo ações concretas para resolver o a, a questão hoje da crise climática a nível do nosso, da, 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 uh, do nosso planeta. And in my point of view, I would like to to tell, to say that this conference not represent us because they not do real actions for solving the problem of the climate crisis. Então, existe muitas falsas soluções apresentadas e já está quase 30 anos discutindo é, entre as partes é, soluções para o planeta e nada se resolve, porque hoje, na América do Sul, principalmente no estado no, é, na, na, no Brasil na região amazônica a destruição tem aumentado cada vez mais hoje tem projetos de lei no Congresso Nacional 
para retirar os nossos direitos sobre sobre os territórios. And we have spent almost 30 years discussing discussing by the parts and not solving everything uh, and especially in the America Latina we have some projects some bills that uh, doesn't afflict directly the indigenous people. E, esse, e é por isso que nós estamos aqui para também solicitar a ajuda e o apoio de vocês para nós combater esses tipos de crime que estão cometendo conosco, com o nosso território e com o nosso planeta. É, se utiliza muito o termo crise climática, mas o termo mais correto que poderia se utilizar é crime contra o nosso planeta, crime climático. Obrigado. And that is the reason that I would like to say that this uh, should not be called of a, crisis, a climate crisis, uh, should be called of a crime against our planet. Thank you so much. My name is Mindaji Bastida from the Otomi Toltec peoples from Central Mexico. Um, And also, I, I, I can, I can speak English. English. Okay. And also, uh, representing here the the Condor, the Condor and, Co and Eagle Council, and the Alliance Gardens of Modern Nature. For me, it's a great honor to be here today, because uh, education is uh, very important. But the kind of science that we are producing is not the science that we need for the career life. We need to transcend from the, you know, from the, this modern positivist way of thinking that is based in the anthropocentric, that is killing, is killing life. And, is, and also the, those uh, sacred texts that say that we are the peak of the creation and we are just another species. There is a big problem. So the curricula that we are looking for is go from the science that uh, parcelized knowledge to the inter-science that is uh, interdisciplinary and beyond that, transdisciplinary science. Because we need to acknowledge that there is not just one way to, to acquire knowledge. So for that, we are bringing ancestral wisdom. Because uh, instead of taking care of life, many people is taking over through science. So this is about dominion code, and we need to transcend that dominion if we want to, if we really want to transcend as human species, because we are putting at risk at least, they say one million, scientists say one million species, but it's beyond that. It's just not biological diversity, because we don't separate culture from biodiversity. It's biological heritage, biocultural heritage. It's together. In our views, it comes together. We cannot produce culture without nature. So the deep love that we have as original nations uh, to nature is the love that we have for ourselves. So we need to acknowledge the spiritual relationship that we have among beings. And then for that, we need to protect the sacred. And it is highly needed to, not religions, spirituality. For that, we need to really go back to uh, acknowledge the original instructions about reciprocity, responsibility, and reverence for nature. Thank you very much. I, I don't have that much time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, they, they, I, I was saying before in the introduction to Nanopia, they remind us of something that we forgot. They carry a very, very important method for people in the global north that we might be too busy to, to understand. And we are so, so grateful that you are here because we need you. 
very, very much, and it's very important to have you here. I will quickly pass the mic to Gerd. Gerd comes from Plan, Plan, uh, um, Plan Amazon, and he has an education initiative that he would like quickly to talk about. Yes. Thank you so much. As uh, Chief Nina has, men has mentioned, we as the Alliance of Movenitius Guardians are in contact with the youth in Europe, the youth, the activists, but we are also traveling to universities. And we want next year to do a tour, like European tour of universities. So we would be delighted if the one, because it's very quick, we didn't have the time to explain exactly our project. But we would be very interested in if some people could contact us and you know that we could organize this tour together because obviously, you know, it's the youth that they are going to really help us solve that issue. The youth and the indigenous people, it's a good alliance. Thank you so much. So get in touch. Thank you. And I need to take on the time. Do we have five more minutes? Uh, we ah, okay, so we still have a little bit of time. And we need to go to you guys. Um, may I have two or five minutes? Because there are two very interesting people. Uh, one is Howard. Howard would like to come in and talk to us briefly a little bit about 1.5 max. Um, so I had been honored for participating in 1.5 max climate summit this year. And some of the things that surprised me the most was that they were actually filling a gap. They were filling a gap because all the COP26 related events were for school, uh, sorry, were for um, college students, were for universities, but there was nothing for schools. There was nothing until Howard and Tom uh, the two people who came up with the idea started working on this amazing project, and I pass them out to you. Well, <coughs> thanks very much, Nicholas. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, very briefly, we um, have just run a summit involving nine schools around Scotland and four schools from the Global South. Uh, that is two from Mozambique, one from Malawi, and one from Nepal. The idea was to uh, create a different way of learning. Um, much of what we've been talking about is education. I don't think we've focused enough on the way in which people learn and the way in which people can get to know each other. And that's been a key part of what we were doing with 1.5 Max. It was a three-day summit. The um, people who've been involved have been teachers around Scotland, given their own free time. I would just make note that all the time given has been given freely by volunteers, teachers who are already stretched, and the same for teachers in Nepal and uh, Maputo and Zomba. The, um, the objective was to make sure that the event was socioeconomically diverse, the event was regionally diverse, it was an event which brought together people to hear local issues, local problems, and address them themselves with support from other countries. Um, we've had very good feedback. I think the objectives were solid, strong. We really appreciate the comments that we've had from everybody here today because um, much of the same ideas we had in mind and we're just trying to move this, move this forward in Scotland and to uh, establish and develop these contacts with the Global South. Um, very good feedback. We've had uh, children saying this was life-changing. We've had teachers saying it's been absolutely fantastic. So we're very keen now to move on from where we are here to the next steps and scale up. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, I had I had amazing, amazing opportunity of being part of 1.5 Max, and I could see how students, pupils, they are little adults. They can take informed decisions. They just need the information in the right format. And pe just to talk to them was a very humbling experience to see how 
well they express themselves, how important for them is mental health, well-being, how important is for them the climate crisis, and how important they felt for being part of 1.5 Max. They were becoming change agents, they were developing innovative thinking towards environmental problems, and we need innovation, we need creativity. So I'm so glad that I could pass the mark to uh, Howard. And the last person I would like to pass the mark for briefly talking about climate fresk. Uh, is Leah. So Leah comes all the way from, in well, she lives in England, but she comes all the way from France. Um, actually, City Glasgow College has a partnership with Climate Fresh. We are, we have capacity to train 1,400 people on climate education throughout the two weeks of COP for free with Climate Fresh. We're very proud to have you, Leah. Would you like to pass the mic to you? Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, hi everyone, my name is Leah. I would also like to invite Fanny, uh, who is also a climate first facilitator, so I feel a bit less alone on the stage. Uh, this was not prepared, and um, I'm really glad to have her here with me. Um, so we are Climate Fresk, we are, actually, let me just take this off. Um, we are Climate Fresk, we are an NGO that focuses on uh, climate change, uh, climate education, and we have a workshop um, that focuses on raising awareness on climate change. So it's a three-hour workshop, based on the hand, heart, heart model. Sorry, hand, heart, hand. Hand, head, heart, hand model. Sorry about this. Um, and uh, the idea is to uh, raise awareness through this workshop uh, that is based on the IPCC report. Um, so it's scientifically accurate. Uh, it also is a collaborative uh, workshop. So it's a really good uh, team, bu team building exercise. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite fun, let's be honest. It's a good way to understand the gamified, uh, gamified uh, education. Uh, I know some of you actually already have participated in uh, this workshop uh, in city or online, so I just want to thank you, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, obviously, we're not very uh, well known uh, in the UK so far. That's why we are here in COP to uh, bring uh, quality and scalable education uh, to COP26 and to the international negotiations. Um, and we have a um, program that we offer to universities, uh, including City of Glasgow College, called uh, CICO, so Climate Education Kickoff. And it's something uh, that we really want to bring to the UK. And um, yeah, uh, Fanny, do you want to add anything else? <laughs> Hello. So yeah, uh, as I say, Leah, it's a, a game of three hours. So yeah, it's very easy to make it. Uh, it's a concrete action, uh, education that you can, um, yeah, uh, take in place very easy. It's not like uh, this morning we present a big program of uh, education uh, training that will make uh, years to make in class. And the workshop that we propose, it's a tool, it's a game of yes, forever where you will go through from causes to consequences of climate change. So in the three hours, the students, or even it's for any people in companies, etc., uh, they will be, they will have this uh, big overview of climate change issue. And yeah, it's a powerful tool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so Climate Fresk is actually really, really great. Um, it's very visual. Um, people understand the science behind climate change in a very interactive way. It's not like that traditional learning and teaching, info sharing, where you have the teacher here, the student here, and you're just sharing information. Actually, it's collaborative learning. It's collective intelligence. So it's breaking a little bit with that traditional learning and teaching dynamic. Uh, and it's very, very effective. Um, and with that said, I will um, pass the, the mic to Tali, or Brad, to Brad, thank you. Um, he will um, talk to us a little bit of summary about today. Um, there you go, Brad. Thank you very much. And I, I must just say, this has been an extraordinary event truly inspiring, and it is wonderful to be in the company of colleagues, of activists, of thinkers, of communicators, of people who are really committed to so many questions of justice and to see how they are trying to 
bring it to fruition here in Glasgow and in their own communities. And as a member of UCL staff, I must just say how proud I am of our students, of the work they're doing, and also to just extend once again our gratitude to the City of Glasgow College for this wonderful opportunity. Um, we've heard a lot about institutions of higher education and further education, tertiary colleges, and what we could do. And so I, I wanted to offer some reflections from that vantage point as institutions whose role and mission is to, to clarify, to convene, and to raise consciousness. And around that, I want to pick out three melodies, let's say, that we've heard from over the course of the day. The first is generational. You'll have to excuse me. I'm uh, still struggling with uh, Sudafed and, and waiting for it to, to, to clarify my, myself. Um, so in the first instance, um, in the breakfast meeting, Tony Burns raised the point of young people, of uh, the youth, and he said they get it. They understand what climate action is all about. And I would say to that, it's not just because they are young. It is not just because of that. It is also because these are, this is a, a group or a demographic of people who have been excluded. These are people who have been excluded from all sorts of social and economic opportunities and who are also bearing the brunt, or may indeed bear the brunt, of further climactic challenges. And that is why we are seeing young people in large measure out there. Uh, and I think that's really important to recognize that, to recognize that this protest is coming from a deep sense of anxiety, of, of fear of their future, and their own sense of injustice and how it is, how it is felt through their voices. And then we've also just heard, we saw in the film from Fiji about elders who feel that they've also lost their cultural ties. These are other people who are bearing the brunt of climactic disaster, which is being visited upon their islands. Again, not of their own, not of their own choosing. Um, so as we look at this, and, and Ken pointed out that there are many of us who have benefited from the age of industrialization, and we are here in a city that was built up on the, the fruit of that industrialization, but to recognize that there are others out there who are losing as a result of this. And that um, takes me to the next point around participation, how we participate. Ken set out uh, a series of levels and uh, positioned um, tertiary institutions at the, at the meso level here. But there are broad questions here in terms of who is included. A central criticism of COP26 has been that it has been so top-down. It is disgraceful that we have <coughs> activists from Brazil, from Mexico, who are being shut out of these discussions uh, because these discussions are being led by other people who may have their own agendas, who may have never actually visited sites of displacement, of deforestation, sites where we see the, the horrors that uh, are taking place right now. Um, and that's actually being generous to them. I think that there are other agendas here at play. So there, there are other questions of how do we collaborate? Um, Charlie spoke about an ethic of participation, how we can build that into our own work, how we should do so. And I think as um, members of an academic community, these are questions which we need to take on board you know, before we set foot, not just before we set foot in the field, but as we design our research and we think about who is going to be affected by it, how might they be affected by it, and equally, who can be involved in that research? The role of children, children speaking to other children, providing a youth perspective, something which is not immediately presented in academic literature or indeed much of the, the, the gray literature. And that takes me to, to the next point, which is about knowledge. And we've heard a lot about that today in terms of what counts as knowledge. We've just heard 
uh, quite stringent criticism against a, a positivist framework, the idea that there are only certain types of science-based knowledge which count. And as we know, there are many forms of knowledge. Wisdom as a concept is not a new thing. It is, you know, going right back to ancient philosophies. It is recorded in terms of the ways in which we learn, how we embody that learning and pass it on. And that is not necessarily structured in the way in which we see it today, that there are indigenous forms of knowledge, there are many forms of knowledge, local knowledge and otherwise, which need to be recognized, which need to be part of the canon that we not only teach students, but we embrace ourselves when we talk about how this feeds into policy. What counts as evidence? Um, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. I've seen too many reports that just sit on a shelf. Um, they go nowhere. Um, there are other ways in which we can inform people, we can use ideas to advance agendas. And with that, we need to, I think, return to this question of justice. So we we started off this morning hearing about some, let's call it redistributive models of justice. And we see that in terms of even pledges that might be made, whether it's with respect to foreign aid or um, the ways in which states might take, a, take into account the, the challenges that uh, we're currently facing. But again, it, there are deeper questions in terms of who benefits, how is this, how is this organized? Uh, I'm reminded frequently of the difference between solidarity and charity. And in this context, seeing images from Fiji, seeing images of people who are actually bearing the, the direct costs of the emissions which are produced in the global north, and yet, how are they to protect their own citizens? How are they to protect their own communities? If we are going to talk about justice, and that is central to the language which has been used over the past week, we must recognize that justice must be dignity affirming. It must place people at the very center of it. And with that, recognizing the context in which people live, that they cannot be separated out from the natural environment, and equally that the natural environment is what sustains human existence, as we have heard from, from Brazil. So then the question is, what can we do as actors, as members of uh, a learning community? Um, and to that extent, I think what we can do is we can raise our voices. We can say, you know, this is, in the first instance, absolutely outrageous that people are being locked out of these discussions. We can um, clarify what is being said. We can demonstrate that you know, what is presented as evidence may not be sufficient evidence, it may not be convincing, and in fact, it may not be to the benefit of those in whose name these states and governments are speaking. And equally, we can act responsibly ourselves. Um, and that's not just as consumers, as we're being told, that the market is going to deliver for us and we should therefore act responsibly. Even as institutions of higher education, there are all sorts of decisions that need to be made, whether it's around um, our suppliers, you know, whether or not we're actually sourcing responsibly. That, of course, can also be taught to students, whether it's in the culinary practice or in aviation as well, that the decisions they make as managers, as chefs, actually have all sorts of ethical impl implications. Um, and it's not just about whether it's the treatment of, of, of animals and the way food may be sourced, but also the ways in which our buildings are produced and the labor that goes into the construction of the buildings and the energy that goes into the construction of those buildings and how they may be repurposed. That is said. That said, we can engage in this what can only be described as a, a major cultural challenge of actually shifting minds and raising awareness about how responsibility 
is felt and enacted at multiple levels. And I feel that you know, today's discussion has demonstrated across multiple geographies the ways in which this, this plays out, as we've seen from Fiji, from Brazil, we've heard from Mexico, but equally here in, in Glasgow, and where you have actually a more progressive government that is actually trying to advance uh, an agenda around climate justice to, 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 to bring that to the fore, right? So that this doesn't just become a singular event, but that this becomes part of the language and the landscape uh, which is definitive and which is something which will inform future careers of students, future opportunities, um, but also how we go about our everyday lives. Um, and, and with that, I would just like to thank you. I found this a truly inspiring event and uh, it's been wonderful to make these connections and I certainly hope that these connections will be deepened and we will see further action resulting from this. So thank you. Can I um, thank all the colleagues here today and I want to start by, because I know some of the colleagues are leaving by saying Obrigada Jeboayana and uh, your colleagues and I'm conscious that um, we've had a very full day, I'm conscious that we have Thank you. I'm conscious that we have raised a lot of debate. I'm conscious that uh, there's a lot of reflection needed. Um, I too am very proud of the City of Glasgow College. Um, our city way is to be inspirational first, to remain excellent in all that we do, and to be innovative. So in many ways, one of our values is partnership, and I think we value that partnership, not just in a civic role, but we value it in an academic role, in a, a role as a peer higher education institution. And when Brad and I and uh, Paul and Ken have been discussing this, I don't actually think we could imagine it was as successful as it was today. And part of the reason for that is that the digital sphere that we've all been subjected to for the last um, two years, one and a half years, or whatever, has limitations. And unless you bring all the actors into one room and give everyone a voice as much as we can, and not everybody did get a chance to speak in, in open forum. Many people spoke over lunch in the breakfast time or at the break times. Unless you give everyone a voice, then you will leave people behind. And as a college, I'm well used to the hierarchy of opinion and the hierarchy of elitism. But that's never stopped this college, and indeed this country, from action. And I think what we have kind of galvanized today is a kindred spirit, and we have galvanized some reflections for action. So today, as you leave, and tonight, as you speak to your families and friends, and tomorrow, when it's a new day, try and take some action. Try and do something from today that you didn't do before you came to this event. Certainly at a strategic level, UCL and the City of Glasgow College will continue that partnership. But this isn't about us. It's about the individual and what the individual can do Given that COP is a convening space, given that this event is a convening space, and given that you as an individual have a role to play in this too, it's not about them, it's not about the leaders out in the blue zone, it's about as an individual, based on today and what you've seen and what you heard, and I thought the experience from the Amazon, I agree, was most powerful indeed, and, and I agree it is most shocking that they have been excluded from that conversation. But we haven't been excluded from that conversation. And we have voices and we have responsibilities to share what we heard. And we have responsibilities to continue the fantastic work that you're doing and your team, Charlotte, and you should be very proud of your team, as Brad is proud of your team. The, the work you're doing is very pioneering and very timely. And we are very proud, Nicholas, of the work that you're doing as a past president, but indeed in your project advisor role 
very powerful, uh, and I, I thought it was quite eminent that we give the last words to the students in this whole session and the youth and, and the next stage of our planet's development. I'm optimistic as I leave here today. I hope you are too. I hope you share what you have seen and heard today. We'll certainly be able to record that. You'll be pleased that will be documented, Charlotte. But I leave you with the thought, what are you going to do when you walk out the door? Thank you very much. <laughs>